Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. It was supposed to be the perfect wedding. You're making plans and you're getting excited together. Until the groom pulled a no-show. I was in complete denial. Now. You don't go back to someone that disrespects you like that. This is a special kind of betrayal. The Jilted Bride reveals a startling confession. What is it you want to say to your mother and your friends? I wanted to let you guys know that. <laughs> Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. was just one month ago that Sasha was set to marry the love of her life, the only man she had ever been in a relationship with. Now, they planned to have three children, a dog, and a white picket fence. They had this all laid out. Sasha says she and her fiancé spent the entire year preparing for their dream day. Take a look. Out of all the weddings I've been to, my wedding was going to be the best was gonna be what I dreamed about my entire life. I was marrying the love of my life. It was gonna be a princess themed wedding, very elegant, very classy, very beautiful. The venue was absolutely beautiful. The food and everything was fabulous. Rose petals were gonna be on the tables, in the aisles. I had rhinestones on the table cards. I put crystals all over my envelope blocks, or crystals in the bouquets. My bridesmaids had crystals in their bouquets. The wedding was just crystallized. I couldn't wait to wear my dress that day. A princess dress, rhinestones, cut out, crystals, just decked out, just incredible. I invited 125 guests. People came from all over the place. Atlanta, Delaware, Boston, Haiti, from Florida. Everybody was ready to celebrate our love. I couldn't wait to marry my fiance. Well, me and my fiance, we grew up together. We were a couple since we were about 18. He was my first and only serious boyfriend. The only guy I've ever really been intimate with. We had our lives all planned out. We knew where we were gonna live, what type of house we wanted, the white picket fence. We knew we wanted to have three kids. We even named our future kids. So we planned everything down to the T. Life was gonna be perfect. When it came to the wedding, he had 100% say in everything. Every time we met with a vendor, he was there. Every time we chose anything that had to do with decorations, he was there. I was 1,000% certain that this was the guy that I was going to be with for the rest of my life. My wedding was going to be a fairy tale night, the happiest day of my life. Then, finally, the big day arrived. 125 guests began showing up at the venue, and that's when Sasha found out the man of her dreams was not showing up. He was leaving her literally at the altar. It was a story that went viral, even making international headlines. The day of the wedding, I woke up so excited. We had our makeup and our hair done. We we're ironing our gowns. We were taking pictures. We were so excited. This was the big day. Between 10 and 11, my fiance was supposed to come to the hotel to pick up a couple of things for the venue. I'm waiting for him to come. 10 o'clock is rolling around. 11 o'clock is rolling around. And I got on the phone with him. I'm like, where are you? You need to get here right now. He kept saying that he's on his way. I'm almost there. There's traffic. And I said, OK, no problem. So I just continued to went about my business. So around noon, he's still not there. And I called him back. He says his Uber caught a flat on the Southern State Parkway. I was in complete denial. I really thought this was the truth. I was in my bridesmaid's robe when I jumped in the car to go and find him. I made a left turn at a Main Street traffic light and a SUV T only. My car was totaled, and I had burns on my face and my arms from the airbags. So one of my bridesmaids is on the phone with her brother, and when he called the venue, the venue said, there's no wedding scheduled for here today. That wedding was canceled months ago. I put uh, my fiance on the phone with the general manager of the venue. Word for word, he said, 
You need to tell your bride what's going on. You lied to me and you're lying to your bride. There's no wedding scheduled for today. You only gave me a $500 deposit and that was it. My fiance is hardly saying anything and he hangs up the phone. I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't believe what was happening. And I said, there's no way. There's no way. She was in complete shock. Her face was just blank. She just kind of didn't understand what was going on. I went to the hotel room and everybody was crying. Sasha, the bridesmaids, everybody was stunned. No, nobody can believe what was going on. He was nowhere to be found. We couldn't reach him. And that's when I realized, wow. I don't think I'm getting married today. You had no clue until minutes before. Yeah, pretty much. You said, in a matter of minutes, your 10-year relationship went down the drain, as well as $20,000. Yeah, of my own money. That you personally invested in this big day. Mm -hmm. 10 years gone in 10 minutes. What time was the wedding? The wedding was supposed to be scheduled for 5. Okay, 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So about 10 or 11, you're talking to him like, uh, where, where are you? We're in the hotel. We're getting ready. Me and my bridesmaids. We're getting makeup done, hair done. And I'm on the phone with him the whole time. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I'm coming. At that time that you're talking to him at 10 or 11 o'clock, mm -hmm. and he's saying, uh, oh, I'll see you in a bit, on yeah. the way. He was on speaker. He knows he's not coming, right? I'm assuming, I mean, he has to know. Well, right. Yeah. Because as it turns you out, know. you talk to him again later, and he says, uh, you say, you're still not here. What's going on? Traffic. Mm -hmm. Traffic. His Uber caught a flat. But then the Uber got a flat. That was after. First mm -hmm. it was traffic, then the Uber got a yeah. flat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at 10 o'clock he had to know. When he's caught in traffic, he had to know. When the Uber got a flat, he had to know. So where was he when these three conversations were actually happening? So apparently he Do was... Do you know now? I mean, now we're all assuming that he was home the whole entire time. Did you see him the night before? I saw him the night before. I said bye, gave him a good night kiss, and he said, I can't wait to marry you tomorrow. Okay, now, as it turns out, you have to reserve these venues because this venue was beautiful, right? Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to reserve these venues months ahead. Yeah. He put down a $500 deposit yeah. or something. Then he was supposed to make a $3,000 deposit. Yes. That bounced. That bounced. Okay, so how long ago, how long in advance was that? That was around, I think it was June, July that he gave that check. And the wedding was scheduled for? October the 8th. Okay, so we're talking like four months. Mm -hmm. So at that point, he knew he didn't pay that deposit. He knew, but the people kept giving him time. They were very, very nice. Now, you're not some bridezilla here. He wanted the big reception. Yeah. He, want, you know, he, was the, he was involved in every step mm -hmm. of this. So he had to know how long now do you think in advance that he knew that this wasn't going to happen? I think he knew around August that it was not happening. Okay, so in August he knows. Mm -hmm. So August, September, and then into October. So like for at least eight weeks, you're seeing him regularly. Mm -hmm. Every day. And you're talking wedding, and you're making plans, and you're getting excited together, and you're looking at crystals and mm -hmm. all of this. And he's just going right along with the whole time he's knowing, I'm not marrying her. Probably. I'm not, probably. <laughs> I, I'm saying deconstruct this. The question is, what did he know and when did he know it? For? We were at the venue on the Saturday before the okay. wedding. And d did the venue say? They never told me anything. And they the reason, say, what are you doing here? No. The reason why, when I went back and had a meeting with them and asked them, why didn't you guys tell me? They said, because I, pretty much I was handling so many other things. He was in charge of the venue. So they were going back and forth with him. They said they didn't want to panic me. They didn't want to make me nervous about the situation. They were dealing with, dealing with it with him alone. Because okay. I told them months in advance, I don't want to have anything to do with the venue. It's between you and him. Okay, so they're not talking to you because maybe they're talking to him on the side saying, hey, you pony up the money at the last right. minute and we'll come through for exactly. you or something. Exactly.
Your family has said, your friends have said, they will disown you if you reconnect with this guy and get back together with him. That's right. Are you talking to him? I am talking to him. And later, if you take not another piece of advice that you get from me today, hear this if you hear nothing else. Monday on an all-new Dr. Phil, Scott Peterson sits on death row. You believe he did not commit this crime. He has told so many lies, and there are no lies about murder. Now, the bodies were found where Scott went fishing. He places himself at the crime scene. His sister-in-law claims new evidence. Fourteen witnesses saw a pregnant woman walking a dog. Could clear him. If they're not seeing Lacey, who are they seeing? That's Monday. After my fiancé didn't show up to our wedding, he completely disappeared. Nobody knew where he was. I was so angry, so depressed, and so hurt, I decided to just write out my feelings. And while I was writing out my feelings, I'm like, you know what? Let me send it to the shade room. It's like an online tabloid for Instagram. So the next thing I know, they actually posted my story. It was on the Sun Times in England. It came out on Twitter, Facebook. It was on Black Sports Magazine online. I was like, oh my God, this story is really going viral. I was absolutely glad it got posted because I wanted everybody to see exactly what happened to me. Three days after the wedding, mm -hmm. you emailed the story online to a gossip page, yeah. and it goes viral. Mm -hmm. Subject, my fiance never showed to our wedding. This was supposed to be me and my ex-fiance, but he never showed up to our wedding. People showed up and flew from everywhere and went back home after the venue turned them around. I found out he never paid the venue. I was at the hotel getting ready with my girls when this went down. Ten years gone in ten minutes. Now, you say ten years because you guys have been together one way or another since you were in, like, grade school. Mm -hmm. So not only were you romantically involved, you guys grew up as friends. Yes, absolutely. That was my best friend. This is a special kind of um, betrayal. Yeah. Tell me if I've read this right. I still love him. I do. Now, your family has said, your friends have said, and I quote, they will disown you if you reconnect with this guy and get back together with him. That's right. Are you talking to him? I am talking to him. Are you considering marrying him? I'm considering it, but I have terms. Do they involve handcuffs? <laughs> <laughs> um, I gotta know. I gotta know. How did he explain this? He said he had a nervous breakdown. It wasn't his fault. It was a mistake and he wished he could take it back. Okay, he had a nervous breakdown mm -hmm. that lasted for two and a half months. <laughs> no, I'm serious, I, I, right. I, do, the, I, I do nervous breakdowns. This mm -hmm. is what I do. <laughs> okay. He, he had a nervous breakdown for two and a half months. How did he hide that when you were there for the food tasting? No was idea. he shaking and sweating and hyperventilating no. and throwing up? No, he was very calm. He's a very calm individual. He was a calm nervous breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't his fault. Um, whose fault was it? Honestly, I think it was my fault, the venue's fault, and his fault. How was it your fault? How'd you make the list? I guess, honestly, I didn't see the red flags that were thrown my way. And I should have been more maybe aware. Should have been more on top of things. What'd you miss? There was a couple of instances where, um, with a, for example, with the photographer, 
He said he paid the photographer. He never did. And uh, the photographer kept calling me, and I ended up paying his half because he told me to cover his half for him, and he'll pay it back. He'll pay me back. Well, that's a red flag. Yeah, that's a red flag. Was he having a nervous breakdown when he lied about that? Nope. That was just a lie? Yeah. Why do you think he didn't show up? I honestly don't know. I keep asking that, myself that question, and I keep asking him that question. And if he wasn't going to show up, why do you think, since he's known you since, like, the third grade, why he didn't tell you, just like, I'm panicking here or something. I, I, we need to call time out or something. I really don't know. I truly believe, like, he really did have a breakdown before. But if he knew he wasn't going to show up, why would he let you fly in and gather 125 people and put that crystal adorned dress on and get ready to walk down the aisle and not tell you. This is your best friend. Why would he not, even the night before, call you and say, hey, listen, this is really chicken, but I can't let you go down there tomorrow. I'm sorry. I, just, I can't do it. I guess we'll, we'll never know. We'll never know. Oh, yeah, we can know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you need to know? I would love to know. But right now, you're really considering reconciling with him. I am, yes. And you want my help telling your mother. Yeah, oh my God. <sighs> well, Sasha's mother, um, maid of honor and bridesmaids have no idea Sasha is talking to her fiance. They say she needs to move on and forget about her runaway groom once and for all. Well, they're here. And they haven't been listening, but they're here. And we're going to meet them after the break, and she and I are going to chat them up about where things are right now. We'll be right back. What happened to Sasha was mortifying. He caused my family a lot of pain, shame, embarrassment. There's no way anyone is letting her get back together with him. You don't go back to someone that disrespects you like that. And later... You know, I love you guys very, very much, but I have to be honest. Let's not string people along. <laughs> this is shocking to me. This is actually our engagement picture. When I look at it now, it only brings me sadness. After my fiance didn't show up to our wedding, it took me a month to go back to my apartment. I couldn't go back to many memories. It reminded me too much of him. I destroyed all the photos, all the symbols that reminded me of the relationship. I took them, I ripped them, and I just threw them in the trash. I still can't really go to the bedroom. I have a lot of wedding things in there, and so I just sleep on my couch pretty much. I think about this all the time. Every single day I ask myself, why me? Why, why, what did I do to deserve this? But he's the love of my life. He's my fiance. I still love him. Those feelings, I believe, will never go away. Well, Sasha says it's only been a month since her wedding guest arrived to find out there was no wedding. Uh, because the groom, well, he didn't show up. Her mother, Georgette, maid of honor, Martha, and bridesmaids, Katisha, say good riddance to any man who could do such a thing. What Sasha fiancé did to her on her wedding day, I don't think there is any excuse for that. He caused my family a lot of pain, shame, embarrassment. That was the worst day, worst day of her life. What happened to Sasha was mortifying. It's every girl's worst nightmare. Sasha wasted her 10 years with that guy. I told Sasha she has to be strong because those 10 years you lost him, you cannot buy them back. 
So you have to move on, move on with your life. That's all you can do, you can't do anything else. I know her for being so happy and bubbly and she's known for her laugh. I just want to see her get back on her feet and see her spirits lifted. Sasha should definitely move on from her ex-fiance. Sasha should not just move on, but move on happily. I tell Sasha not to have any conversation whatsoever with him. Don't call him, block his number from your phone, delete his email, no communication with him whatsoever. There's no way anyone is letting her get back together with him. You don't go back to someone that disrespects you like that. Nobody is letting Sasha make this kind of mistake. We're here to knock her back into reality. Okay, thank you for being here. I, I wanted to speak to Sasha alone first just to kind of get her feelings and thoughts about all of this. So from your point of view, from your perspective, tell me what went down here. You actually went looking for him, right? Yes, I did and, go looking and for him. You, you had a problem. Yes, um, so when I found out that he was stranded, supposedly, on the side of the highway. I decided that I was going to go ahead and go searching for him. So I took my mom's car, and I um, was making a left turn at an intersection, and a SUV actually crashed into me and totaled my whole car. So I had to go to the hospital. So you're out looking for somebody on the side of the road who isn't on the side of the road. Yeah. He's sitting home in a beanbag or something. And you're, and you damn near get killed. Exactly. And, and you, so you go to the hospital, so you don't even know until she shows up at the hospital that the wedding didn't take place. Exactly. Mom, when did you get a grasp that this wasn't happening? I was supposed to be in the hotel at three o'clock to have my makeup done, to get dressed, and to go to the venue. So that's when on my way up upstairs and they told me, guess what, there is no wedding. I said, what are you talking about? There is no wedding? Wh what do you mean there is no wedding? And then, and I went upstairs and I met all the girls, the bridesmaids, Mara and Sasha, everybody was crying, crying. I said, Sasha, what's going on? What's going on? Let me talk to, to the guy who, who's, you know, the host of the venue, from the venue. I said, let me talk to him. And then they call him, and then um, I spoke to him, and he said, yes, the wedding's been canceled. You didn't know that? I said, no, we don't know anything about it. So the wedding's been canceled for maybe two months. Yes, I was shocked. They said for two months. Right. So they, they had known for a long time, there's no wedding planned for today. We went there Saturday, me, Sasha, my sister-in-law, and himself. We were in the car going for food tasting. And then uh, we were like half an hour late. And I told him, call them, call them, tell them that we're going to be late because I don't want to drive there. It's like 55 minutes drive. I don't want to drive there and then we get there, we late so they turn us back. And then he called them while I was in the car. Everybody was in the car, he called them and they said, it's okay, we could come at 4 p.m. And then we went there, four, we, we got there even before four, like 3.45. Then he come back to us and said that, oh, there would be no food tasting. I said, what? I said, what are you talking about? He said, no, because we're late. After all of that, I find out that day, the guy told him, if you don't come by 6.30, that was Saturday, the wedding is Monday. If you don't come back, if we don't hear from you by 6.30, we definitely cancel the wedding. Okay, so the, here's what I'm getting then. So... He goes there, and they're saying, there's no food tasting. You, there's a wedding. You hadn't paid for the wedding. So he knows that then for sure. Yes. What do you think of this guy? What's your opinion of this guy? So my whole opinion changed. He doesn't need love. He needs help. People always ask me, Dr. Phil, what kind of person does that? But when they ask me, it's not rhetorical. They ask me and they really want to know, what kind of person does that? What kind of personality, what kind of value system, what kind of person does that? I'm going to answer that in a minute. But you've you got to wonder, what kind of, of warped thinking uh, 
does that. Now, Martha, you call this a real life sex in the city, but worse. What do you mean? But worse, I mean, it really is a nightmare. From, from what I remember, Sasha, we were all getting ready with all the bridesmaids. We were having our makeup. We were having a great time that morning just preparing. And at that point, she thought, you know, the venue was paid for, that the groom did his part. He took care of everything. And the next thing I noticed, she's storming out of the room. She has the manager on the line, and he's like, you know, why are, why are people showing up? I said that it's canceled. He had his chance to bring it. If he doesn't bring the money by 2.30, th there's no point. And, and Sasha's like, I'll bring it. We'll figure it out. Like, is this a joke? And he's just, he's just like, I'll pull something together for you if you can get me the money. But I'm already convinced that your groom is a liar. So he even made Sasha call the groom on three-way. And he, he, you know, he told him, he was like, why don't you tell your bride what kind of liar you are? Tell her that, you're, that you've never given me a dollar. And that if I have to and you give me the money, we'll, we'll make the wedding. Like kind of hinting out to Sasha that it won't even be how you imagine. Like we'll pull it together, but like your groom is a liar. And I just... You know, I'll never forget that. So the what look. do you think of this guy? What's your opinion of this guy? So my whole opinion changed. You know, I thought he was a great guy. I thought that, you know, from all the years that I knew him, Sasha really treated him like a best friend. She called him, she told him everything. It was it was a beautiful relationship and it was just like such a turn of events that I just feel like maybe there's deeper issues. Like he doesn't need love, he needs help. He needs something more than just love. I I can't. So what do you think of your Ex future son in law. He obviously knew it, obviously, right? Obviously, it was, yes. Right. W what do you think? Growing up, he'd always be the one to babysit me, so I always had this great image of him. After the situation, however, it really struck me because he, she could have lost her brother's life that day because he was trying to go in the car with me. I could have lost my life. And even after, he didn't even care. So, I don't know, I feel as though he, as a person, has some type of kink to his setup, the way his mind works, because you can't string something along till the very last second like that and expect someone to think you're a good person. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you what I think is in a person's head like that when we come back after the break. Sasha wants my help with something. Uh, we'll find out what after the break. Let's be completely 100% honest. What that guy did to her, 10 years of your life you lost because of him. This is shocking to me. I still consider my fiance the love of my life. I was with him for 10 years. This was my best friend. As much as I wish to move on, show him that I could be with somebody 10 times better, I just feel like I can't really get away from him. I love him way too much. So now I'm like kind of going back and forth. One day I love him and I forgive him, and the next day I'm furious. My fiance wants to make it work, and I'm just conflicted. My family already told me if I so much as meet up with him or look at him or even say his name, they're disowning me. I know my mom will not be a happy camper. My mom will lose it. I feel so torn, but do I listen to the world or do I follow my heart? So what is Sasha doing? Uh, where is she in all of this? And what is it you want to say to your mother and your friends here. I mean, let's just get it all on the table. Well, you know, I love you guys very, very much, but I have to be honest, and I wanted to let you guys know that I am talking to him. <laughs> You're talking to him, Sasha. <laughs> Are you serious? I mean, I, I just wanted to find out exactly why he did what he did. I felt like I deserved to know. So closure more I than I wanted anything. closure. I want closure. So why are I you reopening know. a wound that... I just want to know exactly why he did what he did. Let's not string people along. Let's be completely 100% honest about where you are, what you're thinking, and what you're feeling. Because what you're saying is really lying by omission, right? Because you're not telling them the whole truth. 
you're not just talking to him on a fact-finding mission. True? True. You've seen so him? So let's tell him the rest of the story. Oh, I haven't seen him, no. I haven't seen him since the day, but, I, but I've been, no, I mean, I don't know what to do at this point, which is why we're here, but like, I, I am talking to him. We're, we're trying to figure out exactly what happened, how can we move on, and um, he did say that he, do, he does pr promise to marry me. He didn't marry me that day, but he is going to marry Good me. Good for him, because he knows lie. what he That's lost. He knows what he okay. lost. Sasha, I understand, like, you know, you need your closure, you want to speak to him about it, but... The only way you can actually move on is if you cut him off. You're just giving him a chance to hurt you again. And it wasn't a mistake. A mistake is you waking up late the day of the wedding. I mean, that's not a mistake. That's like premeditated. I was with him for 10 years. Sasha, it doesn't matter. matter. You've been here time. for 10 years. If you plan to marry him, you could divorce me, okay? What that guy did to her, you've been with him from when you were 18. Now you're 28. 10 years. Ten years of your life you lost because of him. So now you're telling me that he wants to, get, to marry you? After all the shame? This is shocking to me. Don't you remember how mortified you were on the day of the wedding? I Don't do. you remember how you said, I no do. matter what, and you promised and you swore, and you can't forget what he did to you and how you felt. He said we were, you know, going to try counseling, maybe delving deep into like, you know, why he did what he did and, you know, things Sasha, like that. Sasha, you did counseling. Sasha did counseling for uh, how many months? Six months. From six months. I, I don't understand. Well, would you like to know what my advice for her is? You know? Yes, Dr. Phil. Um, and would you like to know what I think about this individual and what caused him to do what he did? Mm -hmm. Would you like to know what I would predict from him in the future? Sure. So why I think he did what he did, mm -hmm. what I think it predicts for the future, and what I think she can do that's in her best interest. Those three things um, I'm going to talk about right after the break. And by the way, we reached out to the groom. We asked him to come here to participate. You'll find out how he responded, and I'm going to speak to those three issues right after the break. We did ask the groom uh, to come. We, we reached out to Sasha's fiancé, ex-fiancé, for a statement, but he declined. Uh, he declined to come. He declined to give a statement. He declined to participate in any way. I, I told you, Mom, that I, I was going to address three things. Um, now, let me tell you, I don't think you should make your decision based on what your, your friends or your mother wants because they're not going to go home with you at night. They're not going to live with you and whoever you wind up with. Um, however, I do think you should weigh carefully what they say because unlike this runaway groom, they're here. They do love you. They do demonstrate that with consistency and predictability. I, I said, first off, who does this kind of thing? Well, the person that does this kind of thing is uh, emotionally underdeveloped. They're someone that their emotional development is stunted at like 10, 12 years of age. This is not someone that is emotionally mature. Um, this is not someone that has empathy. Empathy being the ability to put yourself in someone else's position and experience what the impact of something might be on them. So, and when you have somebody that doesn't have empathy, it's real hard. It, it's real hard for them to behave in a socially responsible way because they don't understand other people's feelings, right? So it, this is clearly an unempathetic person, an unempathetic act that he's done. He didn't take your feelings into consideration at all, only his own. So 
Do I think that he would marry you? I, I have no doubt that you could get him to marry you. I predict you could get probably just about anybody to marry you, frankly. I mean, you're a beautiful woman, and you're... I think you'd... Um, I think you would have them lined up around the block if that's what you want to do. And I can tell you this, I think if you go back and deconstruct your history with this individual, you're going to find this is not an isolated event. And you're going to be very disappointed. And I think what you're doing is you are grieving the man you wish he was, not the man he is. I can tell you this, if you take not another piece of advice that you get from me today, hear this if you hear nothing else. You must, absolutely, unequivocally, non-negotiably must get into another significant relationship before you ever consider getting back in a relationship with this individual. And I'll tell you why. You've only been in one significant relationship in your life. You have nothing to compare it to. You have not experienced what is available in a relationship. As I said, you are an intelligent woman. You are a beautiful woman. You are a motivated woman. You're an energetic woman. You need to experience someone that will treat you with dignity and respect. Your mother doesn't say, divorce me if you're going to marry him because she's just embarrassed in front of her friends. She wants you to have a life that you deserve. And you're not going to have it. If you want to marry this guy, if it's real, it'll be real a year from now or two years from now. Go meet some people, date some people, experience some other things and I think what you're going to do is go, oh, wow, I had no idea. I had no idea. I think you're tunnel vision to this guy right now, and I don't think he deserves to be with you at this point. He has not earned that right. He violated the privilege. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if he truly loves you, he'll wait. Do you accept what I'm saying? I do, Dr. P. So are you going to hook me up with somebody? <laughs> yeah, there you are. There's, there's 7 million people watching this television show. I don't think you're going to have a bit of trouble, and you don't need me to make it work. I want to thank all of my guests today. I'll see you next time. I've said many times, I believe that we have the best audience in television, and Robin absolutely loves sharing her luxury skincare collection with this audience and with you. Yes, in an effort to bring all of you the absolute best products, I am continuing to expand my skincare line, and here are a few I think you'll love as much as I do. My four new face masks are like beauty sleep for your skin because they are loaded with hydration ingredients and powerful antioxidants. And each of your masks has been created for a very specific purpose, right? That's right. Today, I want to tell you about two of them. For firming and lifting, I have a mask packed with orchid stem cells to replenish moisture. I call it, she's looking great lately. What's going on? <laughs> Simply press the mask to your face and leave it on for 15 to 20 minutes. After removing it gently, massage any remaining essence into your skin. And for puffiness, especially under your eyes, or if you want your crow's feet to fly away, try my new under eye recovery mask with Q10 and hyaluronic acid. I named it, I want to look just like her. <laughs> so your eyes will appear rested and more useful after just one application. You also have something new for the neck, right? Oh, yes. My brand new firming neck and decollete cream is Live Life Lifted. 
This peptide packed cream helps firm, tone, and lift these areas with moisture to provide intense healing and hydration without leaving a sticky feeling. Okay. Yeah. Look, you can order Robin's brand new facial mask and all of her luxury skin collection at RobinMcGrawRevelation.com. And audience, you know Robin has you covered always. You're all going home with her face mask. She's looking great lately. What's going on? And her eye mask. I want to look just like her. Live Life Lifted Neck and Decollete Cream. We have a great time here, and Robin and I would love to see you in our audience. The tickets are free. Just go to drphil.com for details. We'll see you next time. A secret inheritance. Oh, I didn't know about that. Until he accidentally butt dialed her. Now. I spent $100,000 gambling. And throwing money at strippers. He's coming clean to his wife. For two years, she thought you were going to work, but you were just checking into a hotel. And his daughter. What the hell is wrong with you spending all the money? I struggle to pay for college. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. is here and she says her husband of 25 years John is a liar she says that he kept his inheritance a secret and spent over a hundred thousand dollars without telling her and she says John almost got away with it that is until he accidentally butt dialed her <laughs> I hate it when that happens when she listened to the voicemail, she says she heard him unknowingly confess everything. And I have a copy. Listen. Well, I take this 90 grand and go do something and we make any kind of money off of it, and now she gets half of it. I'm pissed off about 40 grand in six months. Oh, I didn't know about that either. Well, there's more. Despite being caught red-handed, Angie says John refuses to admit what or who he blew all of that money on. That is until today. My 25 year marriage to John is like being shipwrecked. I'm in a crisis. We just keep failing. I'm tired of living like this. Go and see a attorney and get a divorce. Angie? Divorce is pretty imminent. We fight every day. We fight so much. The only time we don't fight is when we're asleep. Angie thinks she's a perfect specimen. And I'm an A. So you try to come across every swingy that you're holier than everybody else. John has blown over $100,000. John's been deceptive. He's lied about his inheritance. We're in financial ruin. It's just a mountain of bills. I'll admit, I've been so self centered and a sneaky SOB that. I can't remember what I said five years ago or five weeks ago. When I know I'm doing something wrong, I lie my butt off. When my father passed away, I cashed in some stock and it came out to a total of $88,000. My wife didn't know anything about the inheritance. John accidentally butt dialed me and that is how I found out about the $88,000 and I recorded it. Long story short, I walked away $90,000. When I came in here, I, I f***ed up about 40 grand in six months. Oh, I didn't know about that either. It was my money, so I did what I wanted to. I wanted to just go have a good time for John. Angie threatens me that I wanted to get divorced. I tell her, leave. You're not getting anything from me. Don't let the door hit you. John told me that if I try to take the house from him, he will burn the house down. You're not taking this house from me. I'll burn it down. I would love it if John would just honestly own up to what he's done. Okay, now, first off, you two have been married for 25 years? 24. 24. Okay, and how much, if any of that, has been happy? Maybe the first six months. 
We had a four or five years that were good before we had children. Are you serious? You're serious. You tried to divorce me whenever I got pregnant with Savannah. Yeah, because... You moved out on us. Yeah, you knew I didn't want to have kids. I felt trapped. You're so full of <laughs> You told everybody you wanted to. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it didn't start off well. No, he's always been a liar. He's always okay. been hiding stuff. He's always been sneaky. Okay, but you say that now, today, you want to come clean about everything, about how you spent the money, the, the whole thing, right? Oh, wow, really? Right? I, yes, sir. Why now? Why here? I love this woman. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. And if I, the only way to come clean is come to you and come clean, that's what I'm going to do. All right, well, let's get to it. You really think he loves me? The way he's been treating me? I don't know. I just met him. and everything, right? Well, I just met him. I don't know. Give me a minute. I know. I I'm mean, just... damn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Give me sorry. a minute. Okay. Now, I asked John and Angie to each describe the state of their marriage. So uh, I have that on tape. Let's take a look at what they said. The state of our marriage right now is very chaotic, very cancerous. Fighting five and a half days a week is not healthy. My marriage is basically a war zone. The pot is always simmering and about ready to boil over. On a scale of one to 10, on a good day, I'd give him a marriage of five. On a bad day, negative one. I give my marriage a minus one. It's awful. Okay, so bad. Very bad. Both of you say, are there any good times? when he's asleep. <laughs> I've been blamed for 25 years for everything. It's always, it's always me that's done everything, no matter that takes two to tango, I'm always the one that's in the wrong, no matter what. I've been supporting us for over 25 years. Are you serious? Okay, I never worked, yeah. And okay, you, if you hadn't yeah. left the voicemail accidentally, uh, would, would she still be in the dark about this money? Until now. Uh, uh, but you would probably wouldn't be here. The, the voicemail had nothing to do with me coming here. Our marriage has just gotten so bad and everything that keeps building up. So independent of that, the marriage was in dire straits. Correct. Okay. Why did you marry her to begin with? I just came out of divorce a couple of years prior to that and I've, I needed somebody that I could, that was stable and, I, and basically had common sense, not like my first wife. And I loved her. She was she was everything I needed. Basically, she was my foundation because I was a weak you individual. You wanted me to fit the bills, basically, right? And I was like a patsy. No. That's what it seems like to me. I needed her. Okay, take it for what you want it. Well, that's what it sounds like. What do y'all think? I mean, really, doesn't it sound like that? Or am I reading into this wrong? I don't know. I just got here. I'm... <laughs> I'm gathering information, and then see, I accumulate that information, right. and based on everything that people say, then I try to form some action plan to head off in a constructive direction. And I'm going to be a hero today because this has to get better. It has to get better. Because you can't you fall always, off the floor. No, I mean, definitely. We're already this, there. Well, that's right. I mean, this is the only way you can go is up, right? Right. Okay, aside from the lying, right. I know that's a big aside. But aside from lying, if he wasn't a liar, how is he otherwise? I mean, he's good, you know, he's, I guess he's a good parent. When I was working 75, 80 hours a week, I was great. You were great when because my, you were when, supporting us. Now my, you're not doing nothing. When my health deteriorated and I couldn't get a, a medical card to drive a truck, now I'm a He says you're lazy. I'm not lazy. Oh, not he sent us some overwhelming evidence that oh, you're lazy. Okay. That's it. Oh, okay. That means I'm lazy right there? That's what he said is evidence that you're lazy. It's you laundry serious? and leftover brownie in a pot. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Why, I, I, I gotta say, I, well, I, was, pet, I was not bowled over by this. Well, <laughs> only reason was because our house is for sale and our house is immaculate right now so people can see it. All the stuff that would normally be around is not around. But like that, that brownie pan, for instance, I don't even eat brownies. They're so lazy, it irritates the fire out of me because I'm anal about everything being clean. They'll leave that one brownie in there and wait for me to, 
take it out, scrub the pan, put it up. We're not waiting of, for you. We're trying to finish the pan. The laundry, Dr. Phil, when I go to use the, laundry, the washer and dryer, that's what I run into. So I've got to move somebody else's stuff because they halfway do everything. Okay. If you're going to put a load in the washer and dryer, finish it. Don't let somebody well, else do Well, I guess I it. need to set a timer, right, for myself? Well, if you I mean, get God off forbid, Twitter, you'd know when it was I'd, done. I mean, I have to pretty much feed you all the time like a mama bird or something. So you think I got time to worry about the laundry the only being time, in there? The only time oh, you're not on, on Twitter is when you're asleep. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. That's why that never gets sure. done. The man won't even eat unless I bring him home something. So lazy. Seriously. Lazy. I'm the only, I do all the grocery shopping, all yeah, the cooking. Yeah, you do because you're so anal about it. You, you know one thing that I've decided? Right. Would you like to know one thing I've decided? Maybe. Maybe? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I do. Well, maybe I'll tell you. Okay. When we come back. Okay. <laughs> I haven't touched him in eight years because I knew I'm not stupid. I never denied it. I just didn't admit it. Well, hello. And later. I spent over 60 something thousand gambling. The rest of it was in a strip club. Throwing money at strippers. What the hell is wrong with you spending all the money? It's like I struggle to pay for college. Tomorrow. She abandoned her daughter to go and live with her girlfriend in a car. I put up shades to keep people from watching us sleep. Where is she going? You have a tracking device on her car. What is she doing? The device shows some really radical behavior. And what would happen if her parents said, We're not willing to take care of your child anymore. Now what are you going to do? I guess I've got my child living in a car with me and my girlfriend. That's tomorrow. Then, on Wednesday, is cat hoarding taking over her life? You can't go to dinner without her worrying about the cats. I check in on them with the cameras. Were you afraid they're going to watch the wrong channel or something? <laughs> That's Wednesday. I believe John has a porn addiction. Because of some of the sex stuff I saw him looking at. Years ago, I went to a Sex Addicts Anonymous class. I couldn't get anything out of it because all I did was watch pornography movies. I went to the strip clubs and had a girl give me a lap dance, but that's not pornography. I believe that John might have possibly cheated on me. I found an email. My husband was talking to this person about meeting up with her and getting into a hot tub. Angie found out about it the night before Thanksgiving. She packed up, took the girls. I cheated on Angie that night because I was lonely. Okay, we just heard John admitting to cheating on his wife of 25 years. What did you hear? I just heard he cheated. And because uh, he was lonely, supposedly. How were you lonely? Because I didn't move out till then. That's the last time we had any kind of relationship because I found out well, about it. But you say you thought you were getting a divorce. Right. We'd been talking about it before. So you didn't think you were cheating, right? Are you crazy? You've never mentioned divorce. We've always talked about divorce when we first moved in that house. No, I thought I was getting divorced. Uh, I don't have a relationship with my parents. She took my daughter, my two daughters and herself, and they left the night before Thanksgiving. Yeah, I thought my... No, you I, told us to go, remember? I thought our family was you were, He was trying to usher us out of the house really fast. How long had she been gone before this happened? The same night. Yeah, see? He didn't wait, did he? No, he didn't wait. I didn't come You're such here a to, liar. I didn't come here to lie. I'm telling you the truth. It happened the same night. Yeah, because you had it planned. No wonder you wanted us to get out of there. He kept How long did you know this woman? A few months off the internet. I don't really. So you knew her before. I've been talking to her on email. Yeah. Why? Just the way our marriage has been going forever. We weren't ever happy. We had a good marriage up until then. Sort of, I guess. I mean, I was at least sleeping with him. I haven't touched him in eight years. Because I knew I'm not stupid. A woman's not stupid. I never denied it. I just didn't admit it. Well, hello? <laughs> That's not denying it? Okay. So you were lying by omission? Yes. But that's a lie. Yes. Let, let me get this straight now. Um, so you left on Thanksgiving? Yeah, to go see my sister. He told me, go ahead and go see your sister and everything. I had no idea he was planning on cheating on me. H had you had Thanksgiving dinner? 
Did y'all have Thanksgiving it as a family? It was the night before. No, it was the night before because he told oh. me to go have you know Thanksgiving dinner with my family there. Okay. You know, because so y'all didn't think you should have Thanksgiving dinner family. as a family. You guys as a right. family. Yeah, he said, "Oh, I'm just gonna stay here by myself." That's we were you know, fighting. Poor me. That's not true. We were fighting. No, we weren't fighting. That's not true. He's lying. Well, see, I'm just trying to get a picture of this because no, I'm, I know, cause I'm, but... I'm thinking through this. So, okay, it's thank it's night before Thanksgiving, and the marriage is in such a state that you decide I'm gonna load the girls up and go somewhere and leave him home for Thanksgiving, and he's calling another woman to he's... get together and have Thanksgiving dinner with. He's lying. But he, but that's what happened. He did get with well, her on Thanksgiving. I know that's his ulterior motive was always to you know move me out of the house real fast so he can do whatever he wanted to do. Now I know. How many times have you seen this woman? One time, eight years ago. One time, so that didn't go very well. No, sir. And where did that take place? In Houston. It wasn't at your house. Oh no, sir. It was at well, her. Thank house. God you didn't do it at our house. No, it wasn't. At, it wasn't at our house. No, sir. Okay. And uh, did it meet your expectations? No, sir. <laughs> I felt guilty about it after the fact. <laughs> Seriously? You felt guilty? Yeah, because I felt like I was throwing away what we had. Oh, yeah. Pretty much, you did. Because I never touched you ever since then. Yeah, I realized I don't that. Well, I thought him. you just found out about it now. What? No, I had like some kind of idea because I found the email about it on his on our computer. Mm -hmm. I found it, and I had inklings about it or whatever, but I didn't know for fact. But now I know. He has a picture of somebody naked. I didn't think he would do that again. I loved him. And later, for two years, you told her you were going to work. But you were just going down the street and checking into a hotel. Right. No matter what I do, I'm wrong. <clears throat>kind of hung in here and not done much when you find you don't confront these things you don't I, react to I them. do I do confront him well I put together a line of things that I think I would have expected to at least be a trigger for some kind of action in in some way and right. actually it wound up being your timeline of inaction you find that he has a a picture, a, a topless picture of a family member in his, in his truck. You, f you find it. Yes, I okay, th find This it. is a family member. Right. We don't need to be specific, but right. it's okay. And you find that. So what do you do? Well, I confronted him. Uh, I confronted him and told him it's not a big deal. And he told me it's not a big deal and get over it. Right. I trusted uh, him. I guess that's my mistake. Okay, so that he has a picture of somebody naked, mm -hmm. did that seem like this is really odd? Oh, of course it seemed really odd. I but was he said it's not a big deal, it. get over it, and so you trusted him. Trusted him to what? I didn't think he would do that again, you know? Oh, okay. I don't know. So you thought... I loved him. Okay, you said, okay, you what get a free one. They give right? you a pass here, you, and I'll get over it. Okay, so now let's jump ahead. Let's jump ahead. We go to now. Here you decide that he's addicted to porn. Right. Okay, let's, so when you find out he's addicted to porn, then I beat him with magazines. Yes. I told him no sexual relations. I gave up on him, but I chose to overlook his behavior. I didn't choose to overlook his behavior. I asked him to go to counseling and everything. We tried counseling. We tried counseling throughout the years. Okay, it's but never that's helped. What you, th those are your words, not mine. Right. Okay, let's jump ahead to July of 2010. Okay, now this is when you suspect infidelity. Right. Okay, so at this point, you send an email. I can't stop you, nor do I want to, if you need and want this. So he said, look, you're going to do what you're going to do. Well, but, 2013. That, but that's also because my daughter begged me to stay with their dad. Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. All right, 2013. You receive an IRS demand. John said, just a mistake. 
and lied about $88,000 inheritance. I tried to confront him and he wouldn't admit it, so I gave up. I let it go after that. You get an, a, a demand from the IRS for taxes on $88,000. He said, ah, that's a mistake. So you just said, I just let it go. Right. I guess I'm a fool, okay? I know. I know. Well, let's go ahead here. Okay, June 2016. He leaves you this butt dial voicemail that this inheritance that he told you was just a big mistake that he actually blew. Okay? You confronted him, but I gave up asking because I was never going to get an answer, so why beat my head over it? December 2016. He fell for a $4,500 loan scam. Uh, he just got... I, I cried. I, I couldn't believe it. So... I mean, everybody gets scammed. I, I get that. You teach people how to treat you. Yeah. I'm not excusing his behavior. No. I, I'm just saying. I know I've never made him respect me. And that's what I'm trying to prevent for my daughters. But you're role modeling that for your daughters. Well, because that's what I've always been taught. You know, my mom did the same thing. And I guess, I don't know, I put up with it. Stupid, but yeah, put okay. up with it. Well, he says he wants to come clean about what he spent all this money on, where and what. And when we come back, we're going to let him come clean right after the break. That was the stupidest thing I ever did. Are you serious? Is that worth it? Because now your kid can't even go to college. She's thinking about becoming a stripper just to pay for her college. John is very reckless with his money. Our money, actually. Actually, my money, because he doesn't work. In five years, I blew $100,000. In my defense, I was only using my inheritance to go to strip clubs and gambling. Well, I need to have at least two or $3,000. If I go in there with, with less than that, it's no fun. I want to be able to do what I want to do. My husband and I have claimed bankruptcy twice. Both times, we lost our house. A few years ago, I had applied for a loan on Craigslist, and it turned out to be a scam. I got taken for $4,500. My wife has to quit dwelling on the past of mistakes I made and try to move forward if this marriage is going to work. Okay, John admits to having a time of his life blowing over $100,000. Now, where, what did you spend this money on? Where did you spend it? Who did you spend it on? What did you get for this money? You said you want to come clean, spend, spit it out. I, I spent over 60 something thousand gambling in casino in Louisiana. Gambling? Yes, sir. Okay. How about the rest of it? The rest of it was in a strip club. Okay. And you spent it, what, throwing money at strippers or? Uh, throwing money at strippers, drinking, getting private dances. Uh huh. Is that worth it? Because now your kid can't even go to college. She's thinking about becoming a stripper just to pay for her college. Are you serious? So you get an inheritance, right? Yes, sir. Okay. You've gotten several, you've gotten more than one inheritance payout, right? Well, the first one, in, where this started in 2013, I had stock that I inherited and I sold the stock. You sold it. Okay, yes, sir. so at this point, you decided, I, I, this is my money, I can do what I want, so I just want to go have fun. Basically. Okay, so you, you went to a casino, do you have a gambling problem, or do you, did you just, this was your first? This was my first episode. I, only, the only time I do anything stupid like that is when I have money that... Angie and I hadn't worked for it. I felt it was left to me when I was a child. I felt like it was mine and, and I blew it. How do you feel about it now? Well, it was the stupidest thing I ever did. Uh -huh. Because now my daughter's having a hard time going to college. My other daughter needs college money. It was stupid. But at the time, I was only thinking about myself. And for two years, you told her you were going to work. No, when in fact, you were going to just some motel or something. It wasn't two years. It was a few months that I was trying to find a job and I couldn't and I was I was worried about telling her that I couldn't find a job so yeah every morning I'd go check in a hotel yeah, and, that out and stay and then when it was time for her to get off work I'd come home 
Okay, so she thought you were going to work. Right. But you were just going down the street and checking into a hotel. Right. And what would you do? Just sit there. Did you ever no, check I had for no a pay idea. stub or anything? Well, yeah, that's whenever I started noticing and I would ask him. He said, well, they, they messed me over again. I don't have any money. You said he lied about work for 24 months. Yeah, he has been lying about work. Because you're always saying you never get paid or anything. Or if you do get paid, it's just a little that's bit of money. That's not recently. I bought, after I got my inheritance in 2016, I bought this house, cash we have. I bought an 18-wheeler because I drive a truck. Yeah, there's and I, that too. And see, I can never do anything right. I bought a truck, tried to be a business owner, and because the truck was a limb and I kept having to repair it, I lost it. I'm at fault because I tried to better myself. No matter what I do, I'm wrong. You know, I, I asked you a minute ago, I said, there's one thing I've concluded. Did you want to know what it was? You said maybe. Yes. I said, maybe I'll tell you. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you. Okay. When you're fighting about everything. Right. You're fighting about nothing. If the topics are interchangeable, then the topics apparently don't matter. It's the underlying issue that matters. And what is that? You tell me. Why haven't you left? I feel sorry for him, you know. He says he doesn't have anybody. I know he doesn't have anybody. It's just us and the girls. And, you know, my oldest daughter asked me to stay with him. Well, let me tell you, I've talked to a lot of children that would a whole lot rather be from a broken home than live in one. I agree. This is an emotionally barren war zone right. that they're living in. Yes. One of them is actually having seizures yes. from the stress and pressure, 13 of them. Mm -hmm. John and Angie say they both want what's best for their two daughters, but saying and doing are two completely different things. In fact, the younger daughter, Paige, claims her father has physically abused her. Well, we're going to hear from the girls when we come back. My dad has been physically abusive with me because of all the stress at home. I've started to have seizures. You're the one that don't have any problems like you do every time we go somewhere. I don't think that my dad understands how the arguing affects me. Tomorrow. She abandoned her daughter to go and live with her girlfriend in a car. I put up shades to keep people from watching us sleep. Where is she going? You have a tracking device on her car. What is she doing? The device shows some really radical behavior. And what would happen if her parents said, We're not willing to take care of your child anymore. Now what are you going to do? I guess I've got my child living in a car with me and my girlfriend. That's tomorrow. Then, on Wednesday, is cat hoarding taking over her life? You can't go to dinner without her worrying about the cats. I check in on them with the cameras. Are you afraid they're going to watch the wrong channel or something? <laughs> That's Wednesday. I stayed with John for the sake of my children. I feel that me staying has done more harm than good. And it's embarrassing because I'm letting this go on. Our marriage is a roller coaster of emotional abuse. My daughters are becoming me and my wife, and that's not a pattern I want to continue. When both my daughters were born, I prayed to God that if He gave me healthy children, I would not leave them until they were 18. That's why I never talked to my wife about divorce. If she wants to leave, it's her decision. Okay, Angie says John's lies have turned their home into a war zone, and their 19-year-old daughter, Savannah, says... She's done with playing Peacemaker. My home life is like hell. Everyone has underlying anger issues. When my dad is mad, it is everyone for himself. You're the one that don't have any problems like you do every time we go somewhere. I feel like I can't bring people over to the house because I'm worried about my dad yelling and embarrassing me. I don't think that my dad understands how the arguing affects me. My whole family basically fights with each other. How do you think me and Savannah feel? How do you think we feel with you and your Marriage. My sister and I physically fight sometimes, and we get in each other's faces. My sister has the same temper as my dad. I just want to punch you in the face. Then punch me, because I'll hit you back, I guarantee you. 
My parents' marriage does make me fearful that I might have a marriage like that someday. It hurts me to see my parents at each other's throats all the time. Their relationship has messed me up. John and Angie's 17-year-old daughter, Paige, contacted my team because she had something to say to her parents. It's on tape. Let's hear it. My parents' marriage is a toxic disaster. It would be better if my parents were just split up instead of tearing us apart. Don't act like you're the only with answers. I have been begging my mom to get a divorce for years, and I found out my sister has been begging her to stay. She's been trying to stay in the marriage since we were little kids for your dumb ass. I asked her to until I turned 18. I don't even want to come home anymore. My dad has been physically abusive with me. I got in his face and he pushed me against the wall and I fell. And then I ran down the stairs and he chased me through the backyard. I thought he was really gonna hit me because of all the stress at home. I started to have seizures. This is a really stressful place. Since they started fighting, I've had 13 seizures. I'm not turning it around on you, but you are the one that's going crazy. I do not know what a good relationship looks like because we always see them fighting. They never have any problem showing how they feel about each other. Okay, guys, thank you all for being here. I, what's your take on this? I mean, you're living in it every day. What's your take on it? Um, our home life is like hell. What the hell is wrong with y'all? Like, what is wrong with y'all? You knew that he cheated, and you knew, and you stayed. I asked you to stay till I was 18 so that we could, like, see if we could get things together and, you know, be a family until, like, I left. Because I was being selfish, I guess, on my part, because I didn't want to come home to two different households, you know, with my parents split up. But you knew that he cheated, and you stayed. And what the hell is wrong with you spending all the money that we could have been using for the house and college? Like, I struggle to pay for college because we don't have the money to, to go, and I'm going. Uh, well, I'll do whatever I have to do to go, but I'm going. But what the hell is wrong with y'all? I didn't even know, I, didn't, I did not even know that he you cheated. You always tell me, don't tell me anything because I don't want to deal with your problems. It's your problem. No, you know what, I tell you not to tell me stuff if it's going to tear me apart because well, you know you how I am. that would tear you apart? It did. did. I just saw it. It okay. did. But that's I, what I should what the hell is wrong with you from staying? Thank you for what you said. We needed an adult voice in this situation. Thank you. <laughs> Paige, please, what'd you have to say? Um, I think they should have got a divorce a while ago. I've been begging my mom for years because the house is hell and it's like a war zone every day. Um, I have had seizures because of the stress, but I also think because of school, but they're not hoping adding on to the situation at all. So I think if they can't get it together, they need a divorce for the better of our family. So what do we do about all of this? Is it time to quit or is it time to try and fix this? I'm going to be very specific after the break. John and I don't live a normal life at all. I've always begged John to get help for his temper and his controlling ways and his addiction. I'm worn out. This is the last straw. I'm at the point now where if Dr. Phil needs to put a, a big foot up my backside or slap me upside with those meat cutters that he calls his hands, that's what I, I'm ready for. I've seen him save a lot of people and put a lot of smile on people's face. He picks people up off the floor every episode unless they're just knuckleheads. People have a personal truth. Everybody out here, everybody at home, everybody in this audience has a personal truth. Right. And I look at you and you are in a marriage that is mentally and emotionally abusive and you put up with it because that's what you think you deserve. That's all I know. And believe you me, you are teaching them how men behave. You are teaching them what to expect. You are teaching them what they should expect from a man. That he's going to lie, that he's going to cheat, that he's going to steal, that he's going to be deceptive, that he is not, not to be trusted. And they will go find someone in your image and they will marry that son of a bitch and get exactly what you're getting to your wife. My older daughter's already done that and that's what I'm trying to get her away from. If, if well, then late. that validates what I'm telling you. So you need to change what you're 
doing. Whether you two stay together or whether you don't, you need to change what you're doing. You need to teach these girls that you are not the image of what they need to be seeking in a partner. And the best way to do that is to change your game. Now, should you guys get a divorce or not? I don't, I don't know because you've never worked on this marriage. Never worked on you've it. never worked on this. Long suffering and working are not the same thing. Give me 90 days of no kidding, seriously working on this relationship and not being a prima donna diva and hearing what is said by a hand-picked therapist that I am going to arrange for the two of you. I'm going to give you both a copy of a book I wrote a long time ago called Relationship Rescue. And that book is a lot of work. And it actually has a workbook with that book. And I want to give you a copy of that book. I'm going to give you a copy of that workbook. I'm going to give you an audio of that book so you can listen to it in your car. You can listen to it when you go to bed. I want you to immerse your... I want you to learn that book so much you can teach it. Okay. Then... I'm going to do the next level of something with you. I'm going to send you to a retreat as a couple okay. to a place called Onsite yes, in Tennessee where you can really hit the reset button. Onsite is the worldwide leader in intensive workshops. And they will work with you as a couple. They specialize in those that have been through emotional trauma and have mental health issues that invade their lives, invade their families. Do you guys agree with what I'm saying? I agree. I also have a question, too. Like, Ask it. What do we do about us? You That's know? what I was going to ask you. Oh, what are we doing? I'm getting to you next. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right after the break. Now, you two are casualties. I mean, you've been in this war zone. You've got to be shell-shocked in this. You're going to be part of, as this unfolds with these therapists, with them, there's going to be a point at which this becomes a, a family dynamic, and they're going to, these therapists are going to ask you guys to be involved in some way. And I think you need and deserve to have some real individual help and balance, not just in terms of helping you know what to do with everything that you've been exposed to here, but also how to move forward and launch in the right way. So I, I want each of you to have some individual help, not just in terms of accommodating to and reacting to what's happened here, but also in terms of a very focused life coach for both of you to make plans going forward in terms of college and career and managing all of the things and assets that you have going forward. And I assume you have proper diagnostic workups concerning the seizures that you're having? Uh, not really. Yeah, not right now. I don't. Nobody uh, knows why. That's a no? That's a no. Yeah, then we need to look into that. I'm going to get uh, Dr. Frank Lawless and his team at PNP in Dallas, Texas, his neurological team, to review all of those records. And they may very well want you to come in and do a brain scan and look at some things and be sure we have a complete handle on that as well. So I want to look at these girls really strong right. in, in a straight up way, independent of what's going on here. Okay, so we're going to work on that. It's really important that you have a good plan and a good strategy going forward. Thank you. Fair enough? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fair enough? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. I want to thank all of my guests today, and a special thanks to Onsite and Miles Adcox for offering to help this family, and to Frank Lawless and the PNP Center for helping out with Paige. So I hope you guys wind up at Onsite. You're going to have to earn your way there by doing the things that you're doing. And we're going to follow up and stay on top of this. So season 17 is underway. And uh, to celebrate this major milestone, Robin has something special that could change your 
look on life. That's right. right. Well, I believe we all want to look our very best, and that's why I created my luxury skincare line. And to celebrate our 17th season, I have just developed four brand new amazing facial masks. Yeah, she certainly has. And uh, these, <laughs> these masks are just not for women. Uh, I've often said the top of my head is her research lab. <laughs> uh, we have a tennis court at my house, and I have tennis players from all over the place come over and play. She actually came down and put these masks on me and my tennis buddies at the tennis court <laughs> down there. And I have to say, every one of them has pestered me ever yes. since. Yes. These they guys are so vain. <laughs> They now want these masks, so yes. she's had to camp bring sacks of this stuff home for my tennis buddies. They're that, fabulous. Yeah. They work. I mean, Just can't look you at tell? Him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my sheet mask multi pack allows you to try each one. They're all easy to use. Pick a mask, wear for 15, 20 minutes, peel it off, and they're fabulous. So for fine lines and wrinkles, my first mask has peach blossom stem cell extract. And it's called, what has she done? I must do it. For hydrating and firming, this next mask contains orchid stem cells. It's called, she's looking great lately. What's going on? Okay, so if you want to brighten your skin, you'll need ice plant stem cells, which are my, she must have a secret, and I have to know what it is, mask. And lastly, for puffiness and dark circles, I've got Q10 and hyaluronic acid in my, I want to look just like her, under eye recovery mask. Press on under your eyes, wait 15 to 20 minutes, peel it off, you're going to look amazing. All right, you can order Robin's facial mask and all of her products from her luxury skincare line at RobinMcGrawRevelation.com. And audience, so that you can try Robin's new mask, you're all going home with her sheet mask multi-pack. You get all four today. Robin and I would love to have you join us in our audience. The tickets are free, so go to DrPhil.com for details. DrPhil.com, we want to see you in the audience. See you next time. on an all-new Dr. Phil. She calls her husband the Tasmanian devil. He kicked the car door in. He went boom. And a bully. You threaten your wife's life? What the hell's the matter with you? I've never hit her. She'll turn into a victim all. Sounds to me like she is a victim. He gets right up in my ear and he goes, after the show, I'm divorcing you. And then he's like, well, let's go swimming. It's such bull. Are you kidding me? Let's do it. Not a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Jen is here today, and she says that she met her husband, Seth, and their relationship was fast, intense, and passionate. But after being together for 17 years with six, count them, six children, Jen claims Seth is a verbally abusive narcissist who constantly gets in her face and threatens to bleeping end her life. But Seth says Jen is the problem. He calls her controlling, conniving, and spiteful. Now, they're both here today because they want me to tell them what to do with this mess of a marriage. Take a look. My husband's behavior is completely destroying our family. When Seth snaps, he gets really angry and he can puff up like a big bully and his eyes get really black. One time, he was full of rage and he came charging at me down the hallway. He was spitting, he was angry, he was up in my face and he goes, I'll kill you. The other day, we were actually right out here, and we were arguing about money. 
So he came walking by, got mad, and went, boom. On a bad day. As a father, he's dark. He can be very evil. One time, he came home from work, and he has his face, and my daughter came up, and she grabbed him by this face, and she said, Daddy, how come your face is always like... And he looked at her and he said, because I'm miserable, little girl, learn how to spell it, because daddy's miserable. Just last month, I heard on a voicemail him telling my daughter and our four-year-old son to get in the car and put on your seatbelts. Seriously, get the out. It makes me so angry. If things don't change, I want to file for divorce and have full custody of our kids. I've gotten to the point now in the last year that I fear that when he's angry, that he could kill me. Well, Seth admits that he loses control. He admits he becomes verbally abusive, going off like the Tasmanian devil. Absolutely, I feel like I could rage. I can get to a zero to 100 pretty quick, but this isn't just a one-sided person yelling out the other. This is both of us getting at each other. Jen likes to be in control. There's no ifs, ands, and buts. If she wants to do something in the household, she's doing it. She's hurtful in many different ways. Jen will call me a fat ass, a horrible dad. Jen calls me a narcissistic pig. I don't feel that way in any shape or form. I'm not going to a bar every night. I'm not being selfish. One of the main stresses for me is having to work two jobs. I think she takes it for granted because, you know, when you can stay home all day and kind of just lolly out and fold some clothes, I think she's like, oh, this is nice. She does not work. She does not provide an income. My wife does mishandle money. When your whole closet's full of clothes, you don't need to buy another dress. The frustration now is just being pent up, and I keep on putting the cap on it. I keep on filling that bottle up until there's a certain point, and then I do become the Tasmanian devil. And I don't really have a solution. I'm absolutely trapped. OK. Uh, now, Jen, you wrote in not once, not twice, but three times. Uh, claiming your husband's anger is absolutely destroying your marriage. But then you told my team, well, he's loving. I'm confused. I'm confused, too. I'm, I'm very confused. When I say things out loud and I tell people situations, as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like, why am I even here? Like, I should have been gone a long time ago. This isn't even true. But then when I'm in the emotions, it's almost like I'm, I feel like I'm so starving for any kind of attention from him that when he just does throw a little bit something out there like, you know, you mean the world to me, you know, like, I'm so sorry, it is me, like, I want to save you and our kids, our family, and, and then I just get so sucked up with it. I'm like, you know what, maybe he can change. Maybe he does understand because I always feel like I can just change him. Well, I'm not trying to talk you into it being bad. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to find out what the deal is. It's like I just go along so I don't get in a fight. Is this with him. marriage in trouble? Of, of course, of do course it is. Do you threaten her life? Uh, I do. I I have made threats like that. Yes. Okay. Um, now, come on. Wait. Hold on. <laughs> let, let, let's just let's make a let's just make a deal here. Okay. Of course. We need to just be straight up honest, unvarnished truth here, and let's not be among those people that just throw common sense to the wind and try to make sense out of nonsense. Uh, of course. You just said, yeah, I threaten her life, but. There is of course, no there, but. There... You threaten your wife's life? What the hell's the matter with you? Not something I'm proud of, yeah. That's not even, yeah, it's not fathomable. That's ridiculous, yes. Yeah, it, it is, is ridiculous. It's, you threaten your wife's it life. Is. Yeah, I'm going to end is. your life, is what you say. Ridiculous, yes, yes sir. But you're confused. If that's okay. No, that's not okay. No. That's not okay at all. So what are you thinking? Where are you? Are you here? You, you said you, you were this weekend. You were wanting to know if y'all could get together and, and be intimate this weekend while you were here. I mean, you're telling us, I don't feel safe with this man. I'm afraid he's charging him with his hands and fists in the air saying he's going to end my life, he's going to do all of these things. Uh, can, I, can we get together this weekend? Like a date? 
So I'm puzzled as to as I, as I am too. I mean, this is this is the mixed emotions that 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 go all the time. I mean, there's it's a love, it's a hate, it's 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 mixed emotions all the time. He's it's just so like up and down. Okay, so here's a perfect example. Yesterday, he tells me, he texts me in the morning and me and the baby are at one hotel and him and my 16 year old over at a different hotel. And he texts me in the morning. I want you guys, hi, my love. I want you to come over this morning. So we Ubers me and the baby over to the hotel room. We get there and I can tell he's just in a mood. You can tell he's irritable, he's agitated. And I said, what are we doing here? What, you know, like, what's the plan? Are we gonna go see the Hollywood stars? Like, what are we gonna do? I don't wanna sit in a hotel. We have a baby, a teenager. And he's like, he's like, he's like, what the f you wanna do, you know? And I'm like, well, I don't know, like, what were your plans when I came over here? And he's like, I didn't even want you to come over here. I didn't even ask you to come over here. And I said, what are you talking about? You just texted me, you Ubered me over here. And he gets right up in my ear and he goes, after the show, I'm divorcing your ass and you best believe it, bitch. And then he's like, get your ass back. And then I get back into the hotel room. I'm shaking, my heart's racing. I'm trying to get the baby stuff together. And he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm leaving. I'm not gonna stay here. This is why they said not to be together. And then he sits there and he goes, well, let's go swimming. <laughs> and then he's telling me that he loves me and that I mean everything to That's, him. It's such it I'm is. like, are it's, you kidding me? Okay, okay. It, it, you don't deny any of that, right? <laughs> no, but that, I wasn't trying to argue in front of the kids and go swimming, so that last part was but you don't funny, deny any of that. No, no, I don't deny any of that. And no, then he I told me he didn't even remember I, texting me. You got me. up in her ear and, and said the things but that she says you yes, said. Yes, yes. I, I did, but there's no justifying that those no, actions are not, not okay. But there's trigger points of her, of her saying. That's always my fault. Here it goes. It's not. It's. It's. I guess it's. She'll turn it down to the victim. To a victim role, and so no matter how. Sounds to me like she is a victim. If okay, how about this? this? Here's another example. He's been working out of town for a couple years, right? So because he actually misuses all of the finances, I have taken away all ATM cards from him. I have only said you're only doing cash. You're the worker, but I'm everything else. All you need to do is bring in the income. I will do everything else. So he goes and he's working, 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 working. He has $100 every week. I fill up his tank on Sunday night. He has a full tank of gas to get to work and to get back. He's gone Monday through Friday. He has 100 bucks. All he has to do is get food for himself. Tuesday, he calls me almost all the time, over two years. I'm out of money. I don't have any money. I'm like, okay, you threw okay, $100 okay, okay. in two weeks. He goes and he buys a brand new car because his old car breaks down. We get a brand new car. It's under my name. Yeah, I know. He goes and puts diesel gas in it because he ran out of gas. He ran out of money to put gas in his car to make it home. Okay. So he takes it out of a tractor, puts it in his car, blows his engines right down the street, and then calls me, you bitch. Okay, you hold on. Hold, hold, okay, 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 okay. I'm like, what's going okay, on? Hold on, hold on. We're taking a break. I'll be right back. Think about where you actually believe this relationship is. I want you to walk to that screen and make an X where you think you see the relationship. And later... I love my kids to death. They mean everything to me. It's such crap, though. Like, I just feel like so much of it, it's always so fake. Because if you really do feel bad, you stop doing it. You don't continue, 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 continue. Tomorrow, a depressed teen. Brandon wore a face shield to hide from the world. Now a transgender female. I am transitioning into diamond. And homeless. You are living in your mother's car. You've never had a job. No, never needed one, I guess. She took half of your money and went and bought a $2,000 wig. You're broke, yet you buy her $80 shampoo? <laughs> Look at what you're doing to our mom. You think that's funny? That's tomorrow. Then on Monday, A Secret Inheritance. Oh, now, he's coming clean. I spent $100,000 gambling. I struggle to pay for college. That's Monday. When that rages, it goes up to a 10 out of a 10. Just a few weeks ago, 
He had parked his car in a non-parking, got towed. It was almost $500 to get the car out of impound. I had to go down to get the car. He was so angry with me that he looked at me, he's like, oh, kill you. And then his mom was right there, and he turned around and gave her this big hug, and he goes, love you, he's like, thank you, thank you. And she turns around, walks away, and then he looks at me, he's like, Instantly, you can totally turn it off and be a complete different person. It's the craziest thing. Both of you stand up and come here with me, if you would. Just, you stand right here, you stand right here. Okay, now, I have a line up here that I want you to take a look at that goes from dysfunctional to functional. So, if it's really bad, it would be down here. It was kind of like, you know, what you figure is going on behind a lot of closed doors in America, it would be here. If you're like the Brady Bunch just waiting for your own show, <laughs> it would be down here. Okay? Now think about where you actually believe this relationship is. I want you to walk to that screen and make an X where you think you see the relationship. Don't wait for where the other one goes. I want you to do it simultaneously. Go. Wow. Got it. So we do agree on one thing. <laughs> we like red. So you both agree that it's way... That's surprising to me that he thinks it's worse than I think it is. You've been married 17 years. Before you got married, you had friends that said, hey, you don't want to do this. I mean, hindsight, yeah. It was going both ways. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get to you in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Those things went but, through my mind on our wedding day, of course. But you went ahead and got married. Yes. Not only did you get married, you decided, well, I'll have a child. Why do you keep getting in it's deeper? It's like things like, yeah, I, oh, um, I don't know. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I can't explain why I get in deeper and want to keep having more kids. He told I, you to have an abortion. True? But you just keep getting in deeper and deeper. But when he had the baby, I mean, he had never even had a baby. And when he has his kids, I mean, at the birth, I mean, he's crying. He's like, he delivered our last baby. Is this the one he said, miserable, learn how to spell it? That's when he's, that's when he's like different. There's like two Seths. There's like, there's like crazy Seth. And then like Seth who's like in a, a mood, agitated, irritated, disconnected to his family. We can go places. And I'm surprised to be honest, he hasn't been looking out here, looking to see what's going on, all the judgment that's going on. Cause that's how he is everywhere we go. It's constant. And we come home from whatever, the pumpkin farm. Did you see all these, look at all these pictures and he doesn't care. The memories of making anything with the kids he's so into other people. It's, it's like, can you just get connected with our life and maybe we wouldn't fight so much. Maybe I wouldn't be begging for you to hang out with me because you don't take me on a date or, or do okay. anything of value gotcha. with us. Your turn. Yes, the rage, I think there is some, some points where I, I do trigger. Now, I've never hit her before. I've never hit her. And now, I understand those words, those are, those are, those are threatening, those are, you can't take any of those words back. I understand that. Understand I've that. never touched her. She's hit me. She's close fist. I've been punched, what, I can count now, probably about, what, six, seven times now? You say four, six, seven times? But, but I'm the one that's going to go out, and I, I'm the one that's abusive and beating you and beating our kids, or, or I just, I, I really don't understand. I think you just... You know, these, these actions that you're, maybe you're missing the love from somebody. That's why we have so many kids is because they're unconditional love. You get that love from all the kids. Just, they never stop loving you. And I think you, you might be missing that. And so what's your ownership in this mess? I got so much ownership. I've, I've, I've created, I've created chaos for my kids. I've created chaos for my wife, uh, for myself. How do you answer yourself when you say, why do I do this? It's mixed. It's mixed. I, uh, you know, I look back. 
when it when it's all said and done, I'm like, damn, dude, you're just that was not right. I mean, the, all the the bad words you can say, just the acts were not right. But he never apologizes. I have a tough time apologizing. You, I just you, you say you don't hear you you, you kick the car. I do. I, I mean, do. I, what, I I throw what? things around her. I. I but here you, you kicked the car I did. door in. I did. And it's his and car. It's... I mean, it's under his name. It's my car for the kids, but it's okay. his car. He kicked I'm his a, own. It's See, so this stupid. is me talking to him. It's so stupid. And then no, he has this to is pay for it. Hey, what, here, eye contact here. This is me talking to him. But if I need any help, <laughs> I know right where you are. Okay. <laughs> okay? I know right where you are. And <laughs> you'll be the first person I come to. Line one. Okay. <laughs> I'm not proud of it, Dr. Phil. I'm not. I'm not. Do you think this is just immaturity? I think when I get in my, yeah, of course, yes. I think when I get in my rage, I think I act like a 10-year-old boy, but I don't know how to get myself out of that, that, <laughs> that rage. That, I don't, I don't know. Something, something triggers it, and, and I put blame on my wife. I put blame on my kids. I put blame on my work. I put blame on everything, so. Are you a loudmouth? Sometimes. Are you I, a bully? I used to be. Are you immature? Of course. So these are objectives that you would want to change. Uh, yes. You've heard from Jen, so let's meet her mother and find out why she says her son-in-law Seth is not allowed in her house. We'll be right back. I don't want to see my kids get abused. I love your children. I have given them 17 years of my life. I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I'm done. And later. I've been watching you for 17 years. I've been watching you since you were on Oprah. And I sit there and I have always wondered my whole entire life, what would Dr. Phil say to me? Seth and my mom have a very toxic relationship. I'm done! I will never see eye to eye with my mother-in-law. I don't love her. I don't even like her. We've lived with her for probably eight years out of our 17 years. She is a third person in our relationship. So every time we start living together and we just butt heads. I'm the mom, she's the grandma, and she needs to stay in her lane. Well, Jen says her husband, Seth, has a very dysfunctional relationship with her mother, Ruth. Now, Ruth says Seth, well, she just says he's just not even allowed in her home because she is afraid of his uncontrollable rage and violent tendencies. Take a look. I am afraid of Seth. When Seth is very, very angry, he becomes explosive. One time, my grandson was sitting on the piano and I asked him to get off. Seth goes, leave your hands off my son. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Seth can be verbally abusive to the children. My granddaughter had spilled some milk, and he called her a little She is six. My grandson has called me in a panic, crying that his dad is in a rage. I do not feel safe around Seth. He said a number of times, I know how to break a person's neck. If you really did care about the kids, you wouldn't threaten to kick the kids out every other week. You don't even let them sleep on a bed. You make them sleep on a couch. To try to support my daughter has been very, very difficult. I would like Jen to see that they are not good together. I don't want to see my kids get abused. I take care of your children. I love your children. I have given them 17 years of my life, and all I get is kicked and shoved and told I'm a terrible person. Jen and the children are currently living in my home. Every time Seth goes crazy, I'm the one that has to hold everything together. I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you for being here. Thank you. When you say you're done, what does that mean? Uh, I'm done dealing with their relationship as far as trying to support them. And my fiance said, I, I, can't, I can't be here. We need our life together to start. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's just, I'm just so worn down from it all. Mm -hmm. So you're engaged? I am engaged, yes. Congratulations. When Thank are you going to get married? Um, my, my fiance <laughs> said he will not marry me until. Jen and the kids move out because he wants us to be together, just us. And so we don't have a, a real date. 
because she doesn't have a date that she thinks she's going to be able to move out mm -hmm. with the kids. So he has some common sense. Yes, he does. Very smart man. Yeah. Do you think she sometimes provokes him? There's been a number of times when um, she'll be uh, very upset on the phone, uh, really uh, yelling at him. But at the same time, Seth is a bully. Seth has been up in my face. No matter what I do to help this family, he's charging at me like I'm, I'm ruining his life. And, and, it's, her fault. and it's yeah, it's all it's my fault. fault. And or I'm going, fault. I'm taking care of your children. I'm stepping up when I know the two of you have difficulty stepping it up and taking care of your children. There was a point in this family chaos that a shotgun was involved. Jen and, and Seth got in a big argument. All of a sudden, Seth came and he started banging at the door right here. I was coming up to the door. Banging on the door. He just kept saying, let me in. He was just like in a rage. My cousin was living with us, and he had dropped his shotgun. He was fighting with my cousin, and Seth took it. He put it up like this and said, you want to end me? You want to do this? Then do it. Rage went into me. I basically wanted to take him out. Everybody thought I was extremely crazy, so they ran, hid, called cops. It was the scariest night ever. I thought for sure that we are not going to make it through the night. I came home from work. Right. You and were then you already guys drunk. All went berserk and then you left. Yeah, me, that's how I yeah, feel, Dr. Phil. Go. Every day that I have to so deal with this nonsense. That was so long ago. It was so stupid. And, yeah, and well, I'm just bringing it up because it's just, it was a long time ago, which means this has been going on a long, long time. time. All oh. right, next, we're going to hear how Seth and Jen's constant fighting affects their children because... They do it in front of them. Their 16-year-old son has a lot to say. I get afraid of my father when he rages. He's grabbed me by my arm and uh, one time with my neck. He grabbed me by the neck like this and lifted me like two or three feet off the air. Well, Ruth says her son-in-law, Seth, not only abuses her daughter, but also flies off the handle and rages at her grandchildren. Now, she says Seth called his six-year-old daughter a stupid little girl after she spilled some milk and told his 16-year-old son that he could not wait for him to turn 18 so he could hit him. Well, let's hear what their son has to say. I get afraid of my father when he rages. While my dad snaps, is him talking as loud as he can, spitting everywhere. He's grabbing by my arm and uh, one time with my neck. He grabbed me by the neck like this and lifted me like two or three feet off the air. This past year, my dad punched a hole in the wall. My mom had gone crazy on him. I had to stand in between them to like try to stop the fight. My dad said, like, is this the day that I'm going to hit you? It was definitely scary. My parents fighting has definitely affected me and my school life. I've always been an A-B student. This past year, I actually got an F. My little brother and the little sister, whenever they hear the fighting, they'll kind of run off into the corner. I would call myself the protector. I tell them to go into a different room or like close your eyes and just turn around and go. I fear one day that my dad will definitely either hurt my mom or one of us. What do you think about that? It sucks. Embarrassment. Not even... I love my kids to death. Your kid, you know, your flesh and your blood, your kids. I mean... They mean everything to me. It's just, like, it's such crap, though. Like, I just feel like so much of it, it's always so fake. Because here's the thing is, he's been like this, but then, like, he'll still, like, you know, go home, and then he'll start yelling at them again. Like, he feels bad, but then he just doesn't stop doing it. Because if you really do feel bad, you stop doing it. You don't continue, 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 continue. <laughs> trying to make sense all the time out of nonsense and that's what I feel that's why I've been watching you for 17 years I've been watching you since you were on Oprah I have had my entire relationship since you've had your show and every single 
every single episode I have watched, and I sit there and I have always wondered my whole entire life, what would Dr. Phil say to me? Well, what he would say to you right now is, let me talk to him. <laughs> okay, because I want to hear what he has to say. What do you want this 16-year-old boy to be saying to himself? The most uh, powerful role model in any child's life is the same-sex parent. Mm -hmm. So you're the most powerful role model in his life. What, what do you want him saying to himself? Man, I don't want him saying the things he's saying of just ha not what, having that confidence. Okay, I mean, but now answer my question. What do you want him saying to himself? That he's, uh, I guess, full of himself. I want him to be just excited, happy. I mean, I don't want him to feel like me. Why don't you model things differently than what you're modeling? Because you're I the most powerful like influence in his life. Course. So you're teaching him chaos. Yeah. You're teaching him emotional meltdown. You're teaching him rage. You're teaching him disrespect of women. You're, you're teaching him all of the things that you're saying you don't want him to be, you're modeling for him. I guess I don't know how to change that. I was never modeled that. I guess I can't blame things on my past, but there's a lot of things I'm lacking, a lot of things I'm lacking that I never, my dad never even taught me how to change a tire, never even put on deodorant, never even taught me how to shave. So these, these things that I'm, uh, maybe I'm lacking and on teaching them, all I'm teaching them is all my bad habits and all my bad emotions. I don't have many, many emotions that I could show. I mean, I know I show a lot of anger. I just, I don't show that kind-hearted person that I am. I mean, wish I could show him. All right, well, let me ask you this. What are you angry about? I want help for myself. I need help to learn how to... <laughs> just tired of the chaos. What do you want? I want help for myself. I need help. I need tools. I need tools to learn how to... <laughs> Just tired of the chaos. And if you had those tools, how would you feel? <sighs> I wouldn't even know. I, I would be able to express myself because right now it's... I either don't say anything at all and I just bottle it up, or... All right, and if you, if you had the ability to express yourself instead of blowing up, how would you feel? I think I'd feel incredible. I think a lot, a lot of my good traits would actually come out. And, uh... So what you really want is for your good traits to be able to shine through instead of all of this stuff. Yeah, because I'm not... I don't just run around life being this crazy person that everybody makes me out to be. I'm not just every single person I see. Am I just going and creating all this? There's a lot of people that I can have conversations with and talk to, but with my wife, I want to learn how some tools to learn how to talk to her. And how, how, would you, how would it make you feel if you had the ability for the good parts of you to come through instead of all of this negative chaos, anger and bitterness how would you feel about yourself if you had the ability to throttle that back and push these other things forward how would i feel yeah oh i i guarantee i feel amazing i mean just the whole the whole process of just doing this i mean define amazing how would you feel just a you you euphoric feeling i mean no unstoppable i mean i guess it, in the words if i did have the tools to be able to get through scenarios and actually resolve things because that's that's part of the problem now, is not resolving things. I, I mean, we can... But I'm asking you, how would you feel about yourself if you had those coping skills, if you had the ability for the good parts of Seth to come through instead of all of this bad? How would you feel about you as a man? Oh, I would have self-worth again, for sure. I would, feel, I would feel like a man. Right now, I'm lacking some of those parts. So what you really want is to have some self-worth again. I would. I would like some self-worth. You'll be able to look yourself in the mirror and feel proud? Yeah. I haven't done that in a long time. How long has it been since you've actually been able to feel proud of who you are? <laughs> huh.
in a long time. I don't even think since I was a kid. If I can show you that, if I can show you that, if I can give you the skills to do that, are you willing to do the work to yeah. achieve it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no ifs, ands, and buts. Because uh, that's controlled by you. Doesn't matter what yeah. she does, doesn't matter what she does, doesn't matter what anybody else does. This has to do with you. It's for me wanting to be better for myself, my kids, for my, my wife, my mother-in-law. This has to do with you, whether she gets better or not, yeah, whether she course. stays the same with or, or not, not of course. whether she's perfect or imperfect. This has to do with you. I've always felt that way. Well, okay, we'll see. Jen says she wants to know if she is messing up her kids' lives if she stays in her marriage to Seth. I'm going to tell her what I think, then I'm going to tell these people what I think they need to do, and I'm going to be very, very specific. I feel every Friday, every payday is a fight. The pressure is all on me to make the money. I would love it if she was able to work. Seth takes me for granted. I do everything. I am a single mom that is married. I wake up with my kids, brush their teeth, grocery shopping, cooking, laundry, everything. It's still not enough. He's never happy. You have to make a decision about whether you want to continue to complain but take no action or whether you want to change this situation. And here's the deal. When you get a divorce, you don't solve a problem, you just have a new set of problems. Right. You, you think you get a divorce like, whoo, boy, out of that mess. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. You have six children together. Mm -hmm. you, you just have a new set of problems. Mm -hmm. I would much rather both of you say, we're not getting a divorce, and we're not staying married like this anymore either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you guys are so busy blaming each other that you have no time left to sit back and say, what can I do to change and resolve, fix, and advance this situation. Mm -hmm. yes. You just bring out the worst in each other. And then you add money problems on top of it, kid stress on top of it. You put all of these things on top of it, and it just starts to show cracks. And so you start blaming each other, and that just simply doesn't work because both of you I'm sorry to tell you, but both of you are emotionally very immature. Mm -hmm. it's, um, this really sounds a lot like a high school fight in the cafeteria. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a high school fight in the cafeteria. The only problem is there are six innocent children caught in the crossfire. This situation needs a hero and it needs to be you and I, I, I believe that you do what you do people turn to violence and name calling and kicking walls or hitting people when they run out of socially acceptable ways to express themselves they do it because they just don't know what else to do right and you need to learn how to do that and you need to learn how to do that and neither one of you, no, if I gave you two a test on how to be married, I guarantee you, you would get an F. You did no premarital counseling before you got married. You ignored warning signs that both of you ha had to have seen when you did it. You just went into it. And uh, th that's just crazy in America. Uh, when you go get a driver's license, you at least have to demonstrate some competency to get the vehicle up and down the street. But to get married, you just have to pay two bucks and sign up. You don't have to show any ability whatsoever. We didn't even get married, though. I mean, yeah, it doesn't even matter. Okay, that's a real pertinent point right now. Not it's right. not a matter of paperwork. It's a matter of the fact that you are together as a couple in a family. 
and you aren't coupling very well. And that has to change. And this is just the beginning, and I'm going to tell you where it goes from here right after the break. You need to have a very intense program of family counseling here. And let me tell you how this works. This means you have to have, this is like negotiating peace in the Middle East. Okay, this starts with a family plan where we come in and we set up boundaries and we agree what happens and what doesn't happen in front of these children. Okay, so there has to be family counseling that sets up what the dynamics in the home are going to be, what the rules are going to be, what the guidelines are going to be, what the boundaries are going to be, what the priorities for the nurturance of these children are going to be. But then in addition to that, each of you have to have some individual counseling. And that individual counseling has to focus on different things. And for you, for example, you need some coping skills. You need some resolution. You need to know how to get past some of the things that, that have occurred in your past, how to fill some of the voids that have happened in your past, and you need to learn what to do instead of meltdown or fly into rage. And once that's done, then you have a job to do, and that's to go to each of your children, but only when you can do it and mean it, like with your 16-year-old, and sit down and apologize. For sure. Yeah. And say, I have let you down. I've exposed you to things I shouldn't have. I know that now. I'm better equipped. I apologize, and we're going to do better going forward. Yeah, I love that. And that's going to be a real big day in his life. And if I make those arrangements, you're going to immerse yourself in it, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Head first. And you're going to immerse yourself in it, right? Yes. Because you, you just think that all I got to do is criticize him, and I win. No, you got to own your part of this. And you've got to support him in getting better. You've got to support her. Yeah. And we're going to start putting that in place right away. And by right away, I mean right now. Fair enough? Okay? Fair enough? All right, we've got to stop. I want to thank all of my guests today. I often say that when people come on this show, and I say goodbye, that may be the end of this, but it's just the beginning of our relationship because the work starts now, the change begins now, and we'll keep up with you guys and let people know how it's going. Thank you. Fair enough? Thank you. All right. Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. I was unfaithful with about 20 guys. She says she can't stop cheating on her husband. I definitely don't rub it in his oh, face. Oh, no, wait a minute. You put this on social media. Don't tell me you don't rub it in his face. She calls it an addiction. A man messaged asking for sex. You didn't say, no, I'm a wife and mother. You said, no, I'm G's girl. Who's G? One of the guys she had an affair with. You're saying you're his. So be his. Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. her husband Dan seem like the picture-perfect couple. Now they have four beautiful daughters and are prominent members of their church. Angela was a preschool teacher and had a beautiful house. They seem to have it all. 
what their friends, neighbors, and church congregation didn't know is that Angela has a secret. Angela says she cannot stop being unfaithful to her husband. And it's not just one man. She says she's been with nearly 20 different men in just the last few years. Now, Angela says her first affair happened after Dan refused to give her money to host a brunch with her girlfriends. <laughs> Take a look. The first time I was unfaithful to Dan, it was because I was upset with him. I had a women's breakfast plan for me and my girlfriends. For whatever reason, he just woke up that morning and was just being a jerk. I asked him for money. Dan told me, no, I'm a brat. <laughs> I'm not really sure how else to put it. I got really upset and I reached out to an ex from the past. One thing led to another and we ended up having sex. When I got home, Dan immediately knew that something was wrong. He just kind of had a sixth sense. She was behaving totally different and very distant. Two days later, I did come clean. I felt gutted, cut completely down the middle in half. I felt like a part of me died that day. He was completely devastated, freaking out. He made me call the guy and tell him that I would never want to talk to him or see him again. After the first affair, I did make a vow to Dan that I would never cheat on him again. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Well, Angela says after she admitted to her first affair, Dan's nonstop questioning drove her into the arms of other numerous men. Well, he's going to ask questions, right? Take a look at this. Following the first affair, Dan didn't give me a chance to redeem myself. Dan continuously accused me of talking and seeing other men when I wasn't. I just figured that if he was going to accuse me, I was just going to go ahead and do it. For two whole years, I just did it whenever I wanted to do it. So I was unfaithful to Dan with about 20 guys. I slept with friends from high school, people that I met at the casino where I worked, mutual friends on Facebook. I was intimate with guys three to four times a week. So I would tell him Dan that I had to work late when I got off earlier. On another occasion, I would tell him that I would have to cover shifts when I didn't have to go to work at all. There were times where I would leave for a couple days at a time to have sexual encounters. One time I even went out of town on a work vacation with another man. I ended up being gone for five days. So at the time, I didn't feel any remorse. I was out of control. When I'm talking to these guys, I just get some sort of high of knowing how good they are in bed. I enjoy the danger, the risk, and the thrill of all of it. I have had sex that has involved choking and bondage. I've even had sex with a guy who happens to be a drug dealer. I've even been to trap houses and drug houses to meet this person. I do this for the excitement of it all. When I'm out doing these things, I completely block out being a wife, being a mother. It's just completely gone in my mind. For the longest time, I was able to keep all of my affairs a secret until one day my daughter found a video on my phone and showed it to Dan. Dan completely flipped out. When people look at me, they would never even think that I had a sexual addiction. I'm a wife, mother of four children. I've taught preschool. I've owned my own business, which is all completely opposite of the life I've been living. I know what I've done is wrong, but it's a struggle. Well, I'm glad you're here. Are you? Yes. Why? Because I'm going to get help. Now, you said Dan has begged me to stop, begged me to stop, but I just can't. You don't really want to stop, do you? Yes, I do want to stop. Why? You just said I get all of this out of it, so wh why would you want to not have that? Because my family and um, having my husband is a lot more important to me than that. You rub this in his face. What is your goal? No, of I definitely his... don't rub it in his oh, face. Oh, no, wait a minute. You put this on social media. Yeah. Um... You say, I'm the side chick. You put it on social media. Don't tell me you don't rub it in his face. I'm trying to get to the point of why you're doing what you do. Right. I focus on why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do. I'm trying to figure out not why you're having the affairs. I'm trying to figure out why you're rubbing it in his face. Yeah, there was a time period where we just were extremely, um, you know, mean to each other. We were extremely ruthless to each other. This was July 27th of last year. Girls can be nice, give second chances. Be honest, be fun. They won't make you look stupid. Rub your back, be there when you need them. Be down when you say, let's go. Check to see how your day is going. Be patient, makes time out of her already busy day and y'all clowns still find a way to mess it up. A male post wondering if Angela is referring to him. Angela, not you though, you're the best side dude. 
This, you're a married woman and you're out here chit-chatting and flirting like you're in high school with your boyfriends. Right. Take me through the moment you're typing this stuff. What, what's, your, what's your motive at the time? Okay. So I have to kind of just say that there were two years, the, within these two years, I was completely didn't care. I didn't care how Dan felt. I didn't care what anybody else thought about me. I didn't care how anybody else viewed what I was going through because I was so hurt at the time just regarding everything that had transpired. I have the mindset that I don't care because people don't know be everything that goes on behind, behind you know, the closed doors of my home. Mm -hmm. um, and there was definitely a point in time where people looked at me as I was heartless. I didn't, because I was. So what was going on behind closed doors that made you to the point that you said, I don't care, I'm gonna do what feels good in the moment? Dan's pretty controlling. Um, he's pretty controlling regarding a lot of things that I do, a lot of people who I talk to. Um, just the fact that I am um, well, with this... kids every single day, all day. I feel like I don't have any kind of adult interaction sometimes. Um, and that's not everybody can do what in the field that I was in. Well, so was he proportionately vigilant? Um, sometimes. Um, you say he's watching what you're doing. It sounds to me like he needed help to watch what you were doing. Yeah, I wasn't able to go out, um, you know, go have a drink with my girlfriends, go out to dinner. Um, just basically anything that I wanted to do was not a good idea to him unless he was there. But you've kind of proven him correct. Yeah, definitely. In needing to be hypervigilant here. Angela says she's different now and wants to change. And let me tell you, people change, absolutely. You can say leopard doesn't change his spots. Nice saying, and good visual, not true. People do change, people can change. When their motivations change, their behavior follows. Well, something happened three weeks ago that makes me wonder if we've hit one of those points or maybe we really haven't. We'll be right back. Angela has no shame. She's come home with hickeys on her neck. She's had unprotected sex. When Angela would come home, she would act nonchalant. It's like nothing happened. And later... When this last affair happened, and she wanted to please let me come back home, said, no, you need a different level of help. This is that different level. Hear That's me. Where we are. Most of my affairs have just been completely about the thrill and the excitement, but there have been a couple that were emotional. I had an emotional affair with one guy. He would tell me that he loved me, but I wouldn't say it back. Another time, I formed an emotional relationship with a man at the casino where I worked. He was also married, and we talked every day. We both would say, I love you, but it just became too much of a heavy emotional connection. I had to break it off, even though I was really emotionally attached to this guy, because I knew I was getting into something that was wrong. Well, Dan says his wife, Angela, often packs a bag, turns off her phone, and disappears for days at a time to have sexual liaisons with other men. Now, he says the hardest part in all of this is that he doesn't think Angela is capable of stopping her cheating ways. Angela is not capable of being faithful right now. Angela has a huge desire for men to tell her she's beautiful, and if she doesn't get that affirmation, she will go find it. The last two years have been an absolute hell. There were times where she would pack a bag and she would just be gone. She would turn off her phone, social media, her location finders. It was like she disappeared. When Angela would come home, she would act nonchalant. It was like nothing happened. Angela has no shame and does not respect our marriage at all. There have been times where she's come home with hickeys on her neck. I know for a fact she's had unprotected sex. On top of that, she has rubbed her affairs in my face. One time she sent a message to me on Instagram that said, it doesn't feel so good when I mess with somebody else, does it? On multiple occasions, I've came across posts on social media with her and other guys. When you don't get to see your boyfriend on Valentine's Day until after 9 p.m., hashtag you're the side chick. She's telling the guy she was having an affair with that she's a side chick and that's just how it's gonna be. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't breathe. 
Last summer, Angela and the guy she was having an affair with had a falling out. This guy got upset and sent me a video of them having sex. It was the most horrific feeling I've ever felt. It got even worse. The same guy posted prerogative pics that she had sent him on Facebook for everyone to see. One time, my daughter brought me Angela's phone and was showing me a video of Angela kissing another man. I was beyond furious. At this point, I don't know if Angela can change or even if she wants to change. Well, Dan, thanks for being here. This can't be a fun topic for you. Not at all. Uh, do you want this marriage to work? More than anything in the world. Is it past that point? Uh, I don't know. You've not hit the point where too much is too much? We're here today because I'm there. You thought she had been involved with as many as five men, right? Right. Uh, how many actually have you been involved with? About 20. Uh -huh. What's your reaction to that? Disgust. Uh-huh. It's just mind-boggling. I, I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't understand our mind process. I don't understand the decisions, where it comes from, why I can't be enough. You've said that that annoys you. Sometimes. I don't think it's just pain, but sometimes he can just be like over the top. Like I understand that it's hurting, but when it's like a continuous. But when the cheating is continuous, the hurt is continuous. Of course it's going to be pain. Of course I'm going to react, probably like not, well, what's normal to reacting to this? Is there a normal behavior? The normal response would be to look at her in your rearview mirror. Right. That, that would be the normal, that's, that's the typical response. I mean, statistically, people always ask me, Dr. Phil, can couples survive infidelity? And the answer is yes, they can. Uh, but that doesn't mean they will, and it depends on the, the level, uh, the magnitude, and whether or not the partner weaponizes the infidelity. And you have weaponized this infidelity. Men have sent videos to you having sex with your wife, uh, and you knew those videos were being taken, correct? No, a lot of the times I was just intoxicated and wasn't fully aware. Now just three weeks ago, Dan says that Angela called him and confessed that she had cheated yet again, but take a look at this. I've worked really hard in the last six months. I've been extremely faithful to Dan, but I just slipped up about three weeks ago and had an affair. While she was at the job interview, I had access to her messenger, and a guy she previously had an affair with sent her a message about getting together. Dan totally freaked out. Something clicked in my mind. If he was freaking out about it, I might as well just go out and do it. So I did. I went to go see my friend, and we got a hotel. She basically demanded to come back home and told me that we were going to get through it and work it out. I was like, no, we're done, but here we are. Then you say five days ago, a man messaged asking for sex, and she declined because, quote, she's G's girl. That's correct. Who's G? One of the guys she had an affair with. Mm -hmm. you, you have not only disrespected our marriage, our love, our children, our house, our family, but now you're saying you're his. So be his. So you're saying, I, you didn't say no. You didn't say, no, I'm a married wife and mother. You said, no, I'm G's girl. Yeah, um, it was one of G's friends, which is why I responded like that. I just wanted him to stop talking to me. Okay, Dan says he's so angry about his wife's betrayal that he's worried he's gonna snap and kill her or one of her male suitors. We'll be right back. There's this rage I have that stems from her countless betrayals and lies. This is what he's decided to do to my bathroom. Dan told me that he was gonna end up killing me. I'm gonna snap. And later, if there's anything worse than what she's doing, it would be what 
you're doing. You don't have to explain and every single detail. And you should be back detail. later. That, that shouldn't yeah. even be a possibility. Dan says his wife's blatant disrespect and multiple extramarital affairs have left him angry and often unable to control his rage. Take a look. Angela's infidelity has consumed me, and I've become completely obsessed over it. Following the first affair, it was horrible. Dan would cry every night. Other times, he would become extremely angry. He would just scream and yell, throw things, slam doors. At times, I've let my emotions get the best of me. There's this rage I have that stems from her countless betrayals and lies. Dan would go down in the basement and just punch a wall. One time, there was just blood everywhere from him just going at it at the wall. Back window busted, back gate busted. This right here is my mirror. There's glass all over the place. Another time, Dan had a meltdown, busted everything in the house. This is what he decided to do to my bathroom. Busted up the toilet, busted up the sink, all of my clothes. It was just completely ripped apart. Dan told me that if things kept going the way that they were, that he was going to end up killing me. I am concerned that one day I'm going to snap and hurt or, or kill Angela and kill one of the men that she's involved with. Okay, now guys, this is serious. This happens. You're playing a very dangerous game that you don't have the right to play. There are children involved here. There are children involved here. And when we've got a 10-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 7-year-old, a 3-year-old, and every one of them deserves the right to not be caught up in a literal crossfire, not to come home one day and find mom and dad or mom or dad dead because somebody lost control of their emotions because the two of you were not mature enough to work out what's going on here. Now, your behavior is outrageous. It has to stop. You know that. I'm not, I'm not telling you. you. You know that. And I actually believe you do want to stop this because I'm going to ask you a few questions in a second and it's going to tell him why he should believe you want to stop this. Um, and look, I'm, I'm not even going to get into whether you are the perfect husband or not. I have no doubt that you're not a perfect husband. There's only one of those. Uh, your behavior gives him a pass because what you're doing is what's called outrageous overshadowing. When one person's behavior is so outrageous that it overshadows the behavior of another. It might very well be that he has things he needs to change. And those things can be worked on, but not while you're doing what you're doing. You never fix problems in a marriage by turning away from your partner. You get my point? When you go and have one of these sexual assignations with somebody, and you're going back home, and you're dealing with your children, how do you feel about yourself for what you have done? I try really hard not to feel, but I feel really horrible. What kind of role model do you think you're setting for your daughters? Definitely not a good one, and I've, I've noticed that you know, the change, you know, since it started with their behavior and things like that. And they have said some very ugly things to you. They'll just say, like, go out and get drunk and go see your boyfriend. Have they called you names? Yeah, they've called me a whore, slut. And how do you feel when your own daughters label you in that way? Not good at all. They didn't even know what those words meant before all of this happened. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Dan says not only has Angela abandoned their daughters during these sexual trysts, she's also put them in potential danger. What does he mean by that? We'll talk about that when we come back.
it is completely ridiculous that she has exposed the girls to her affairs. The girls have told me to go get drunk or go be with my boyfriend and just be a whore. Dan actually told them about my affair. It was extremely inappropriate. It wasn't fair and it wasn't right. Angela was absolutely being a neglectful mom. When Angela was having these affairs, she absolutely put these men over our family. Because of her own stress and anxiety trying to hide everything if she would end up treating the girls like crap. There was times where she would smack them too hard, grab them, and leave marks on them. If things don't change, we're done. It's over. We're getting divorced. Well, Angela says her eldest daughters were only five and six years old when Dan set them down and told them mommy cheated on daddy. Now, four years later, Angela says Dan uses their daughters to help him collect evidence of her affairs. Unfortunately, my daughters know about the affairs and they have a negative outlook about me. It is completely ridiculous that she has exposed the girls to her affairs. They're awake when she's not home. They know what she's doing. When my daughters were just six and five, Dan actually told them about my affair. It was extremely inappropriate. It wasn't fair and it wasn't right. The girls actually asked me why would I cheat on daddy and why would I make daddy cry. I was completely speechless. It put me in a terrible position as a mother. There are times where the girls know she's out having an affair before I even know. They actually gang up on me. The girls have told me to go get drunk or go be with my boyfriend and just be a whore. To hear that from my own daughters is just complete devastation. There have been times where I've been upset and cried in front of them and my daughter would say, why do you even bother? Leave her. Is heart-wrenching and it just speaks to the fact that they have lost hope. My daughters have even gone through my phone and found things that weren't inappropriate and have showed it to Dan. It's completely unfair for the girls to be involved in any of this. I'm absolutely terrified that my girls might grow up to be like their mother and that can't happen. If there's anything worse than what she's doing, it would be what you're doing by pulling those girls in to awareness here. You just don't drag children into adult issues and you just don't use them in, well, th they're in this there game. When she will call the babysitter and say, I'm going to see daddy. And then daddy comes home and they're, they're like, didn't mommy come to see you? No, mommy didn't come see you. I don't know where mommy's at. So, it, that, what you want me to do? I'm, it would be your time to be a father and say, she'll be back later. Like, I'm not, like, you don't have to explain They know everything. she'll be back later. That, that shouldn't yeah. even be a possibility. Through those histrionics, there was a question buried in there. What do you want me to do? What I want you to do is be an adult. I want you to be the calm in the middle of the storm. I want you to say, I'm going to put my children's interest ahead of my own because daddy's hurting because that's selfish and it's child abuse and you don't do that. You don't do that. When this last affair happened and she wanted to please let me come back home, I said, no, you need a different level of help. You need a different level of help. Well, we gotta get this there. is that different level. That's Hear me. Where at. You don't say those things You're to your right. daughter. And, and you say, well, what do I say? They said, she said she was with you and she's not. So what do I say? What you say is there was a change of plan. Don't worry about it. Let's go do something else right now. You handle that differently because when you do what you do, you are recruiting them to your side against their mother. You have the daughters bring evidence. No, no, I don't to you. have they, they them. They have showed you videos of another man. I, I don't have them do it. They'll be on the phone. It's not like I set them up to do it. I, I didn't know anything was on the phone. Well, shame on both of you for putting these children in the middle. Shame on both of you for putting children in the middle. So is Angela doing all of this for attention? I think I have the answer. We're going to talk about it when we come back.
It's been six months since Dan's suspicions were confirmed when his wife Angela came clean about her countless affairs. Dan believes that her indiscretions stem from something deeper. Angela acknowledges that her childhood has had an immense impact on her behavior. The reason why I'm experiencing some of these things today is because of the horrible things that have happened in my childhood. I grew up in a really rough neighborhood. I dealt with mental, emotional, and verbal abuse regularly. I was routinely physically abused by a family member who even broke my leg. From the time I was about six years old, I did sexual things with another family member for years, and a family member took provocative photos of me. I remember seeing pornography, and I was enticed by it. I thought that it was completely normal. By the time I was 13, I lost my virginity to a boy who was 17 years old. After that, I just became completely promiscuous. I had sex with boys in the neighborhood, and I did this because I just wanted to feel something. I needed some sort of void filled. Because of all that, I have an issue with commitment. I feel like I'm just not good enough for anything. I tell Dan over and over again that I'm just not good enough for him, and I'm not good enough for the kids. The past does affect me today. I've tried to get over it, and I just can't seem to get past it. You, you say that you've tried to get over it. What does that mean? What have your efforts um, entailed? I've tried to forgive people, you know, from the past who have hurt me, um, regardless of their viewpoint on it. Um, I've tried to um, be a mom that I didn't have. I've tried to kind of, um, you know, build something that I never thought that I would have. Where was your mother when all this was going on? When the sexual abuse started happening, what was her involvement? What, what was her reaction? Um, she didn't know. Did you ever tell her? No. There are things you wish you had gotten from the adults in your life earlier on that you just didn't get. Right. And there were things you got from some family members that you wish you didn't get. I ask you what you've done to try to deal with that, and you've tried to deal with it on your own. You've tried to forgive certain people. You've tried to say, I don't want to carry that legacy forward. Right. And have you talked to Dan about this? Yeah, um, Dan has been really supportive um, regarding, um, you know, just my childhood and moving past. And, you know, we've brainstormed ideas and, um, you know, we pray together and things like that. Um, I had a conversation with my mom on the phone um, because it was weighing so heavy on me that I just needed to forgive her and I just did a lot of self-reflection on you know, having a conversation with her. So when it ultimately happened, I didn't get the response that I was really hoping to get. But then again, I knew that it was something that I just kind of had to deal with on my own <laughs> and um, you know, just kind of put it behind me and that was actually... Mm -hmm. um, happened just a week or two before the first affair, mm -hmm. which I think um, might have had a lot to do with uh, the mental state that I was in at the time. Well, what if what you said isn't true? What if you don't have to deal with this alone? And what if you really can't deal with this alone? Well, Angela worries that she will never be faithful to her husband. He worries she'll never be faithful to him. I'm going to tell them both what I think needs to happen here after the break. Here's the thing. As, as we go through life, we all define a currency. When someone takes a child, particularly a young girl, and objectifies her and abuses her sexually, then oftentimes she learns that's what I have to offer and it becomes your currency. And boy, when you step outside the marriage with someone, the adrenaline is rushing and they're telling you all the things that would be nice if it was every day, right? It also made you feel dirty. It also made you feel guilty. It also made you feel like you were doing something wrong. There are wounds in you that are gaping wounds that are open. And no matter how bad you want to be different, until those wounds are healed, 
you're not going to be different. And, and let me tell you this, and you, you need to hear this. This isn't about you. It's about what's happened to her before. Made some mistakes, yes, you have made some mistakes. But I tell you, the one thing you haven't made is you have made the mistake of bailing on your family, your children, or your wife when she is hurt in a bad, bad way. And she has certainly given you a lot of reasons. Um, and it takes a man to stay plugged into this. And I'm, I'm proud of you for doing it. Now, you do need you do need help with this. I want you to meet Irene Jacobs right here. Irene, say hi. 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 Now, Irene is the program director uh, at Willow House, which is at the Meadows, and they have developed the framework of a program that deals with exactly what you're wrestling with here. And I say the framework of a program because they design very customized programs for each and every woman that they deal with. And Irene, you can help this woman, can you not? Absolutely. Angela, you know, Willow House is the leader uh, with women dealing with sexual issues. And my team of certified sex addiction therapists can help you to dig deep into the trauma that led you to use, as Dr. Phil mentioned, your body as a sexual currency. You know, we'll take a look at the anger and shame that is in there and how all of this is contributing to this addictive process. And you will find that healing at Willow House. And I, I'm making this offer of this help to you. Will you take it? Yes. Okay. Right. Switching gears now, if you think your family tree is complicated, wait until you hear about my next guest, Unusual Family Tradition. We'll meet them next. My next guest have a very interesting family tradition. The women in the family tend to do everything together. That's not so unusual, but it includes getting pregnant at the same time. But now that their children are getting older, they want to start focusing on something else, looking and feeling their best. Now, Darlene and her daughter, Christine, were pregnant at the same time nine years ago. But Darlene's Aunt Lydia says she wasn't surprised because same-time babies have run in their family since the 60s. Take a look. Looking at this picture, I realize we look like sisters. <laughs> My daughter Christine and I happened to get pregnant at the same time. Yes, it's true. It just happened. This happened before with my mother, my sisters, including myself. It's a family joke that is a family tradition. We need to stop this family tradition because the family is getting too big. Looking back at it now, yeah, I can't believe we were protected at the same time. I know, I was radiant. I look, I look stunning. You do. So now, instead of bonding over babies, we're bonding over issues with our skin. I found I have wrinkles. I have age spots, frown lines, uneven complexion. The changes that I'm starting to see in my skin would be the fine lines. My deep wrinkles and the lack of firmness in my face and neck bothers me. My plan is to stop the aging process before it's too late. I would like to stop the aging process altogether. I think our family needs a new tradition. We may be aging, but we want to look good doing it. Well, Christine, her mom Darlene, and Aunt Lydia are joining us in the audience. And also joining me here is dermatologist and spokesperson for the beauty brand number seven, Dr. Sonia Batra. So welcome. Thank you. Now, so Darlene, did you and your daughter Christine plan to have babies at the same time? Uh, definitely not. Oh, you didn't plan it? No. It okay. just happened. So now let me get this straight. So Darlene, your nine-year-old daughter is Christine's sister, and your nine-year-old daughter is also Christine's nine-year-old son's aunt. And Christine, um, did I have that right? Yes, Dr. Phil, you do. It's a bit confusing, but the kids got it down, and they all get along really well. Okay, so that works. All right. So, Aunt Lydia, you were part of this family tradition with your sisters and mom, right? Right. 
Okay, and why do you think so many women in your family have children at the same time? Well, it was just a coincidence, you know, that we hap it happened. But we are very, very, very caring family, and we do everything together. St well. <laughs> Okay. We, uh, we do everything together. That is a caring family. We do everything together. All right. Uh, I understand you ladies want to start a new family tradition, which is focusing on yourselves in particular, fighting aging skin. And I'm certainly no expert on that, but Dr. Batra certainly is. I'll leave this all to you. Sure. Well, I wasn't pregnant at the same time as my mom, but I do have two children, and I know how aging that can be. Yet there are simple and effective ways to fight the signs of aging in your skin. And one thing, if you want to do something together that you can all do, is add a serum to your daily skincare routine. But it's really important that you each use a serum that's right for your unique skin stage. Thankfully, the beauty brand number seven has three clinically proven age-defying serums that I highly recommend for all of you because they deliver younger looking skin in as little as two weeks. So Aunt Lydia, we're gonna start with you. Number seven's Restore and Renew Face and Neck Serum is for women with deeper wrinkles who are also experiencing some sagging on their face and their neck. And what it does is it strengthens the epidermis, which firms the skin and helps to treat those deep wrinkles and neck crepiness. I always hear this word crepiness. What is that? <laughs> What is crepiness? <laughs> well, let me explain. It is a term that we dermatologists use to describe texture. So if you think of crepe paper, it's that sort of thinning and wrinkling oh, like on the gyms, neck. we used to... Yeah, yeah like for paper. parties. Yeah, exactly. okay, I got it. Is there a serum that could help Darlene and Christine? Definitely. Number seven's Lift and Luminate Triple Action Serum is ideal for Darlene. It's for women in that middle stage who, in addition to wrinkles, are starting to notice age spots as well as changes in texture. This one helps improve skin firmness and also has a brightening complex to even out skin tone. So for Christine, you mentioned that you're starting to notice some fine lines around the mouth. Number seven's Protect and Perfect Intense Advanced Serum contains hyaluronic acid, which helps plump the skin. According to the brand's clinical research, 96% of women showed a visible reduction in the appearance of those fine lines. So ladies, it sounds like Dr. Batra and number seven have taken care of your skin concerns and crepe crepiness. Uh, so what do you think? Great, excited. it's wonderful, I'm oh, excited. Thank you. Me too. I really need it, I really need it. <laughs> yeah. well, ladies, there's some great news, which is that you can find all three number seven serums at Target and Target.com, and they're each available for under $35. is giving you each a year's supply of the serum that's right for you. Oh, awesome. yeah. And audience, you are all going home with all three number seven serums as well. Okay? So, um, I'd like to thank all of my guests today. A special thanks to Dr. Sonia Vatra. Thank, thank you. you for being thank here. You. Thank you. And uh, if you need my help with a life situation, I would love to hear from you. Just email me and tell me your story at drphil.com. Or if you'd like to be part of our studio audience, we have fun here, right, guys? Uh, uh, the tickets are free. Uh, all the information is on my website, or you can call 323-461-PHIL. That's 323-461-7445. We'll see you next time. Dr. Phil. I'm not here to be your whipping post. I'm here to co-parent. I'm the one who's begged you to co-parent. You don't get a video call if you see her in the day. The prize is not the possession of the child. It's the progression of the child. You're standing in the middle of the parking lot. You raped me! Yeah, you didn't say that four years ago. You said it when it was convenient during a custody fight. The you itinerary? said I'm not giving her I back. I never said I'm not giving her back. You think you are fighting for your daughter. You're throwing her under the bus. And shame on you for doing it. Let's do it. Not a good show, everybody. Here we go. This 
is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Yesterday we met Bronwyn and Brett, exes at war, who came to the show with thousands and thousands of pieces of evidence against the other. Now, Bronwyn claims Brett and half a dozen sheriffs showed up at her four-year-old daughter's daycare with an emergency child pickup order and stole her away. The little girl was handed to Brett and his girlfriend, Sarah, who had never even met the child and that's when this nasty custody battle exploded. There has been numerous allegations of child neglect, mental illness, substance abuse, and even sexual assault. Here's what happened yesterday. When they came and took Bella, I was completely taken by surprise. This custody battle has gotten ugly. Bella lived with Bronwyn and I as a family her whole life. She doesn't know you. At some point, you said that the child was the product of rape. Yes. February of 2016, we got the DNA test back. And then um, I sat down and had a conversation with Brett. I said, Justin thinks she raped me. You didn't know her then? No, I did not. You were there and didn't declare rape. You weren't there and did declare rape. I'm confused. Bronwyn is a pathological manipulator, an absolute danger to everybody she comes in contact with. I kept asking her to see my daughter. She kept giving me excuse after excuse. I had received a picture of my daughter with a swollen face. The state had no choice but to give me sole custody. Did you rape Bronwyn? Absolutely not. She had told everybody for years I was the father. So you just declared that he was the father before you knew it, and that was just to manipulate him into responding? It wasn't a manipulation. Well, it, it was... sounds to me like that's exactly what it is. Shut up. Okay, hey, take a break here. Take, take a break. I'm only interested in what's in this child's best interest, and I'm curious if anybody else here is, oh, is interested. Were you getting support? Subpoenas and notices of hearings that you were ignoring? He ignored them. They have said that in court. It was totally innocent. I wasn't avoiding anything. What about him denying it to the sheriff? That's perjury, my friend. Show me. What? Well, I, what are you talking What do you about? mean, show? You got to listen to yourself. I'm listening very carefully. No, you're not. I don't think you guys are there. You don't hear what you're saying. Can you please calm down? No, Honestly, I will not calm down. You stop. be calm. Please Look stop. Look where you dragged me to. I went to Florida because of you. I've been to California because of you. That's the only two times I've, I've seen the ocean. Thanks. Sarah and Brett claim that Justin hits Bella with a belt, and they have a recording to prove it. She told me Justin hits her with the belt. Is that true? Yeah. And she said it hits her in the button in the privates, and it hurts. Oh, oh you are sick. I was at court. You're I'm sick. sick. That is coercion. But you said I was a so, tyrannical, suicidal alcoholic who everybody is afraid of. You actually are. Self-existent. Oh, really? Bella didn't know we were that, recording that's, that. That's well, just you know what's it. important that is, is I know you were recording it. Fair enough. Are you kidding me? Hey, I'm I'm doing my best. We yeah, never said you we were ever looked, I'm not asking you anything right now because you're not the mother. Okay. Brahman's mother says she remembers her granddaughter covered in bruises at one point and says she has the pictures to prove it. Was she behind all those CPS reports against Bronwyn? My name's Cassandra, and I am Bronwyn's mother. The current situation between Brett and Bronwyn is not serving the best interest of Bella. They need to get through whatever it is they're going through so they can put Bella first. Both parents need to stop beating this child's psyche up, trying to punish each other. Bronwyn has accused Brett of rape. You raped me! She's not terribly credible on that since she's accused five men of this. Bronwyn has an older daughter who's 13 years old. I raised that child. The last time Bronwyn saw her 13-year-old daughter was August of 2015. I am wore out mentally. I have spent tens of thousands of dollars raising this child. I can't do any more. Dr. Phil, I need you to help these parents.
Well, Robin first emailed me back in 2012 after she signed over guardianship of her oldest daughter to her mother, Cassandra. Now, after fighting in court for a year, she says Cassandra convinced her to sign the documents and she would still be in her daughter's life. But that didn't happen, and she hasn't seen her daughter since 2015. Now Bronwyn says her mother has teamed up with Brett to destroy her once again. Take a look. I no longer call my mother mother. I call her Cassandra. Cassandra's highly abusive. She will do anything and everything to get her way at all costs. As a child, she acted as if I was a burden. At nine, I started taking care of myself after school and cooking and fending for myself. When I was 17, I got pregnant with Frankie. Cassandra never wanted me to be a mother. From the complaining about what kind of diapers I bought or the formula I bought or the clothes, just about everything you could think of, Cassandra nitpicked. Cassandra continuously told me how I was unfit to be Frankie's mom. Cassandra would make doctor's appointments and take Frankie to go get shots and things like that without my permission or my knowledge. After Frankie turned six, I signed an over guardianship of Frankie to Cassandra. I felt worthless. I didn't want to talk to Cassandra. My conscience wouldn't allow me to talk to Frankie. I really did not want to talk to anybody. When it comes to Cassandra, I'm not a doctor, but I can tell when someone's sick. Bronwyn's mother, Cassandra, is joining us via Polycom. Uh, you said both of these parents need to stop. Your quote was beating up this child's psyche. Tell me what you mean by that. Both of them are talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, nothing here has established that they're actually wanting to work together to help Bella. But you said in court last year that uh, Bronwyn was an unfit mother. How do you know if you, you haven't seen her parenting? Are you talking about the fact that she has been absent from her other child's life since 2015? Or are you talking about how she behaves with Bella? Bronwyn's form of abuse on Bella takes the form of um, neglect mainly. Uh, she allows her men friends to take care of her children, and I see that it hasn't changed. Uh -huh. how, how would she know that? I mean, I've been with Justin since... Five years. January 2014, so what men friends? I thought he was there since she was born. Right, about three months after she was born. Effectively, Bella's entire life I've raised her. So what about all so the So about the fathers? time of the ads. What other fathers? There are no ads. Cassandra hacked all my emails. She's been in and out of my email since 2008. I don't All trust of your anything. Media. Like she's identity All of my you. social media, everything. I don't trust anything that they well, have out of. Anything. One of the things that the court will look at, and uh, you know, you brought this up in uh, your tape before, Sarah. There's been a, a busted lip, a black eye, mm -hmm. a burn on the arm, mm -hmm. bug bites. These are things that you've seen. Correct? Not personally. Um, I no, don't you've, remember you've bringing seen the all pictures this. of them. Yeah, I've seen uh, the pictures of them. I didn't know what all of that was Bella from. Bella got a black eye at a babysitter. She was immediately removed from the babysitter and taken to another one. She fell on a, p a piece of playground equipment and busted her lip. There's actually pictures that Cassie and Brett have of that day mm -hmm. um, that they pulled out of my email. The, the burn on her wrist was an accident. It was my fault. I turned my back for 30 seconds. She reached up into a pot that I was cooking. It was an honest accident. Okay, I have a question. And then the bug bites, we were out at Cassie's rural, farm. Yeah. Cassandra, did you make the CPS reports? We got those pictures from you. Where did you get those pictures? From Cassie. And how, how did you get the pictures, Cassandra? Yes, I did get into her email account, and I did get into her Facebook at one time. And later... Growing up in the hood, you didn't want to be a shook individual. Shook meant that you were soft. You know, you had to be hardcore. And, you know, I like to live my truth so nobody can use my truth against me. So instead of running from the term shook, I'm embracing it. Cassandra, did you make the CPS reports? I made one report on Bronwyn. Uh -huh. And that report was due to the fact that Bella had hit her head and what she had told my mother, that my mother had called me, and so I called CPS to check it out. 
-hmm. That's it. That's the only one. Mm -hmm. And she says that she is her mom when she calls for that report, mm -hmm. too. And we got those pictures from you. Where did you get those pictures? From Cassie and uh, her family. Where did they come from? Uh -huh. From Cassie. And how, how did you get the pictures, Cassandra? I have accumulated so many things on Bromwin since 2011. And yes, I did get into her email account at one time. And I did get into her Facebook at one time. Uh -huh. So you hacked Bromwin in? Had come to my house several occasions and logged on to her information from my computer. So yeah, I nosed around it. And, and took the pictures, you copied the pictures out of there? No, not all of them. Some of them came from, um, I can't remember the, the uh, upload server that was from, it's like Pixima or something like that. That's what uh, I got a lot of them from. Uh -huh. Well, here's what uh, Cassandra admitted in court documents, that one, that you had hacked uh, Bronwyn's social media and stole private information, that you gave Brett Bronwyn's messages for the custody battle, that you called the cops on Thanksgiving and said Justin shot Bronwyn in the head, and that you located Bronwyn in Florida and gave Brett the address and paid for the flight, and that Bronwyn should not have physical custody because she is unfit. Now, those are the things that you admitted to in court. So you you said that that Justin had shot her in the head and you did that, why? Was this a ploy to try and find out exactly where she was located? No. But once you did know where she was located, after the wellness check, you gave that information to Brett so he could use that in order to actually serve the, the proper papers and, and get the child, correct? I suspected where Bromwyn went. And so I gave him both of those addresses okay. to try to have her served out. Right, and you were doing this because you were concerned for the child's welfare? Yeah, this was completely about the child's welfare and actually my daughter's welfare. Okay. Now, I've got to take a break here, but I want to give you a chance to respond to this. Uh, do you use corporal punishment no. with this child? No, no we don't. Actually, in our parenting plan at court, we were the only ones that submitted a parenting plan saying that we were not going to use corporal punishment. So and they submitted you, one. should have went without saying. We said, talked no, about it in mediation. You don't have one in your plan, and your plan so is adopted. Ha have you spanked this child? No. no. Have you hit this child with a belt? Yes, sir. So my um, daughter's a liar. So, um... You coerced her. So you, I did, right? So you've not hit the, the child with the belt at any time? No, ever. absolutely not. No. I've never hit anyone with a belt in my life. Okay, and... You would be willing to take a polygraph to prove that? Yes, I've never hit Because you volunteered to do that? Absolutely, never hit her with okay. a belt in my life. All right. Uh, Brett wanted to know um, what I would do if I was in his situation and if this was my daughter. Uh, I will certainly tell him when I come back. I'm not here to be your whipping post. I'm here to co-parent. I'm the one who's oh begged my. you to co-parent. Dr. Phil, what's your definition of co-parenting? Well... Telling the other person about their child and doing the DNA test would for a start. And later, you're standing there in the middle of the parking lot. He raped me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't say that four years ago. You said it when it was convenient during a custody fight. And the prize is not the possession of the child. The prize is the progression of the child. Well, Bronwyn says her daughter has been stolen from her in a custody battle. She and her boyfriend, Justin, claim Brett and her mother, uh, Cassandra, have teamed up to destroy her. Now, she also claims that Brett barely allows her time for court-ordered video visits. All right, I love you, monkey. I'll see you on the video call tonight. Bye, baby. Bye. Have her uh, call me on video call when you guys land on in Atlanta. Tonight's the video call night. Sure. You know, it says in the order you don't get a video call if you see her in the day. You're not. No. You, you're, yes, it, Bronwyn. Okay. Well, you I know. You are. You're. Uh, you're okay. Right, Bye, Bella. I love you. <laughs> you are mentally. Bye, monkey. I love you. Have fun, monkey. I love you. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> okay. Um, Did you see the message she wrote me before I got there? Do I asking you out. for the you itinerary? Said, no, I'm not giving her back until you give me the I itinerary. I never said I'm not giving her back. I said it's no. It's on I need record, the... Bronwyn. Please pull it up. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this you, is... you submitted a question, right? What is your suggestion, Dr. Phil? What would you do? Um, what would you have done in my situation? I mean, <laughs> first of all, keep all your qu uh, like quippy garbage, your narcissistic, bipolar human being. Like, keep all that stuff to yourself because I'm not here to be your whipping post. I'm here to co-parent. So, I'm the one. I'm the one who's oh begged my. you to co-parent. You, you were the one that said that I was all these things, calling oh CPS. Dr. Phil, what's your definition of co-parenting? Well. <laughs> Telling the other person about their child and doing the DNA test would for a start. Okay, well, sure let's know. look at let's look at some text okay. here. These are Brett's texts to Brahma. Now, this is July 14th of 2017, and this starts at 6:34 p.m. We will not give up on our one night of going out and having family night for your schedule. 6:35 p.m. You type faster than I do. I am the only one who has even attempted to create a contact schedule, let alone you not even once let me meet her or talk to her. So Sunday or nothing. If you don't like it, take it up with the courts. I did 636. I've already arranged everything around you. You have not complied and done nothing in regards to this matter. There are nine pages of text. Uh, in a four-hour period. I tried being reasonable. You asked me for help. I said, okay, let's give Bella the best of both worlds. You had even said that to me. So you verbally berating her for hours at a time repetitively is reasonable? Like, the question was what time will you be of, home we're talking for about one Bella thing. to talk to so. me? That was the question that triggered nine pages of... I, I didn't know what time I was going to be home. I had it took a took nine pages to say. I'm I not had a sure. fluctuating. Well, I mean, even saying anything to her, I mean, there's a lot of things you haven't seen where she just. Oh, I've seen it all. You she, all sent me thousands of pages. No, of you documents. haven't. You haven't seen it. Well, it's then it's worse than I thought. It is. Listen, you know, um, guys, um, I, I really, really am trying to help you guys here. Thank you. Um, but. You're a bunch of right fighters, is is what you are, and the child is going to pick up the tab for it. I mean, I honestly, I want her to know Brett and Sarah in a positive way, not a trauma, a traumatic way. Getting picked up, put in a car, shipped out 2,600 miles away from the only family she ever met. It doesn't matter. That's why we applied for joint custody it, first, and it, then you took off, and we had to do it that way. I told you I was moving. You told I, Facebook. You were you even know, friends I with told him. you. That's why you said, I bet you didn't know she Why didn't fled you answer the subpoenas and come to court then if you wanted I to do it that served. way? You were oh served. My We've already gosh. gone to court Are we for really going to talk about this? This has been proven in the court of law they denied the, It's been proven that he was the one that was mad about it. It, it says doesn't it in matter. the judgment. What show it doesn't matter. matter. Because matter. that's not how we wanted to do it. That's how you made us do it. None of that is true. Be Bella Madden. We were never legally all, served. Is that what you're saying now? No, this this is, it was set aside because we were never legally this served. Is, the no, entire... no, it wasn't. This is a moot point. Okay. It was not. We're not on the page of Bella, and that's where we need to be. Bronwyn, Stop it. You, oh, wow. You texted me. I'm afraid oh. of my blood test and what the results will be. I'm sad. And I said, okay, what does that mean? You said, I don't know. Everything has changed. I just want Bella to get the best of what both are you worlds. Talking what, are you talking about? About? what do you mean? My phone. Pull I gave. Up. I what gave your mom a copy right, of the text. Stop talking. Matter. Stop talking. I'm going to say what I have to say here. And, um, and I'm going to say it because I want to have gone on record as having warned you all. Why do we still have custody? I'm going to tell you that uh, it, it's it, it's kind of like this, uh, you know. Parenting and being right is is on a continuum, and it's kind of like you can you can you can put it on a continuum, and down here is like this is you know the real happy sort of family side of things. And, you know, somewhere in the middle is the reality of life. 
And then down here for a child is when they've got a, a real sad, mixed up reality uh, that they have to live with. And, you know, at best, uh, you, you, you hope you could at least get in to this range here. And, you know, what I often get is I get parents that come in and both of them are arguing so vehemently for their position that they just fight to the death for what they believe is right, 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 right. And I'm sitting there aware that neither one of them are within a country mile of any reasonable parenting approach for a child. Bronwyn and Brett, both of you are down here. Both of you are down here, and both of you are just fighting, fighting, fighting. And what you do is both of you are sarcastic. You're rolling your eyes. You're, the, the, the court of law proved this. Oh, come on. <laughs> this child drew you two as parents, and you come in here belligerent. You are belligerent, mm -hmm. my friend. I understand. And you are self-righteous because you think you are fighting the good fight for your daughter. You're throwing her under the bus, and shame on you for doing it. Um. And you're standing there, they come to pick your daughter up and take her away. I don't blame you for being upset, but you're standing there in the middle of the parking lot. He raped me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't say that four years ago. You said it when it was convenient during a custody I, fight. I said it after you had evidence. What? You want to argue some more? Yes, sir. She just she couldn't say something until she had evidence. Oh, yeah. You're right. You're right. Okay, let's just turn this over to you. You want to take over this conversation? Yes, sir. You want to take this over? We'll put that in the tape, and we'll play that for the judge when we get there. That when somebody was trying to step up and put this back on the right track, you want to chime in and tell everybody how right you are. Away. You don't know, buddy. <laughs> If you want to help here, you will support her in becoming reasonable in this matter and getting her back in the life of her daughter. That's what you need to be doing instead of enabling her in these ridiculous assertions. Both of these two are absolutely out of control of their emotions. Both of them are so engaged in the fight that they have lost view of the prize. And the prize is not the possession of the child. The prize is the progression of the child. And the progression of the child is to take it to the next level. And the two of you should be supporting that. You should be supporting him having a relationship with her that's in the best interest of the child and not sitting back and throwing darts at her because she used to be with him. If people think the reason I'm upset with Brahman is because she used to be with Brett, that's ridiculous. My problem is the things I'm hearing Bella say. That's well, my problem. I have a problem with what Bella says, too. Like, when she comes to me and says that you held her down and Brett heard her privates. So I have to go and take her to take uh, take her and make a police that report. That was hearsay report it, Bronwyn. That was then hearsay. Then why did Child Services tell us there was obvious coaxing there and not even open a case up? They did open a case They up. did open a no, case. No, they didn't. And they were not neither one of us in jail. They, why do we still have custody? <laughs> There's actually a case open right now on you and it is not closed. I want to thank everybody for being here today. We will see you next time. Coming up, a candid conversation with the charming host of iHeartRadio's The Breakfast Club. To come out and talk about this as openly as you do is a rare thing. And later... I'm just going to be honest with both of you. You guys have been very disrespectful of this whole process. If you want to roll your eyes and not do it, then don't. No, I'm sorry. I'm not rolling my eyes at you, Dr. Phil. Yeah, you are. Well, he's known for being bold, brash, and asking tough questions as one of the co-hosts of the nationally syndicated iHeartRadio program, The Breakfast Club. 
Charlemagne the God, who is known as Hip Hop's Howard Stern, along with DJ Envy and Angela Yee, have interviewed everyone from rapper Kanye West to actor Jonah Hill. I even appeared on the popular morning show just recently. Take a look. Everybody is DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. Special guest in the building, Jonah Hill. This is my favorite show. What have you done lately, though? This what week? have you done lately? Well, let's talk about you. You come to work every day. day. I didn't tell you. Stop. Don't say anything. You're speaking my business and you don't know what you're talking about. Dr. Phil. Yes, sir. What's up, Dr. Phil? Good morning. How's everybody? Joining me now, Charlemagne the God. My next guest tonight is the unfiltered radio and television personality, Charlemagne the God. What's your advice, Lena? Because you don't seem like you have any inhibitions. Like, you just, you get naked when you feel like it. <laughs> I do. Get it off your chest, Bird, man. Stop playing with my name. No, I can see why he's mad. He like, never stopped talking about him kissing Wayne in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Bills that he allegedly doesn't pay. You know what I'm saying? My name put some respect on it. Stop playing with my name. I don't understand the angle. I ain't got no more talking. That's right. Hey. Grand opening, grand closing. <laughs> to all the... <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Charlemagne the God. Hey. Hey. Your audience is like, what the hell did we just watch? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Hey, I, I stayed for an hour. I yes. mean, I was there for a whole time. I really enjoyed being there. We had a good time. Yeah, I, I enjoyed having you. Uh, you. You guys have some meaningful conversations about things that matter, and I think you're really breaking some ground with your audience. And you recently published your second book, actually, and it shook one about how your fears and anxieties have propelled you to success. And I've, I've read this book, and... I'm going to talk about why I think it's really groundbreaking, but why did you decide to write a book about mental health? You know, that's interesting because I didn't set out to write a book about mental health. I just wanted to get a handle on my anxiety because, you know, I've had anxiety for my, my whole life. And nine years ago, I got diagnosed with it. I remember um, I had just got fired from radio for the fourth time. As you can see from that package, you could probably see why. But I got, <laughs> I got fired from radio for the fourth time. I was like 31, 32 years old. I had to move back to South Carolina from New York, living with my mom. My daughter was like two. My now wife was back living with her mom and dad. And I remember just driving down the highway feeling like I was about to have a heart attack, like, you know, heart beating fast, yes. shortness of breath, even convinced myself my, my arm was going numb. And I went to the doctor and he was like, you're fine. You're, you got an athlete's heart. And he was like, do you suffer from anxiety? And I was like, no. And he was like, it sounded like you had a panic attack. He said, are you stressed about anything? I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so in my mind, I'm thinking that all I got to do is get me another job, get back in position and everything will be fine. But then, you know, seven, eight years later, I'm, I'm 39 years old and things are overwhelming because life is good, but a lot more pressures come with that. So I just decided to say, you know what, let me finally start going to therapy to get a handle on my anxiety. When you're sitting with a therapist, you start unpacking things that you didn't even realize were there. Right. You know? Yeah, one thing leads to another. Oh, my God. Another. So you lead to the, you get to the source of your PTSD and then trauma from <laughs> things that happened to you when you was younger and you know, daddy issues with my father. Like, I thought I loved my father. Then I started hating my father. And then I started loving him again. It's just like, you know, so that, I just, that just turned into to that. Yeah. So tell everybody what Shook One means. Shook One is the title of a, a classic Mob Deep record. And, you know, growing up in the hood, that was the last thing you wanted to be. You know, uh, you didn't want to be a shook individual. Shook meant that you were soft or you were scared. You know, you had to be hardcore. Like, and, you know, I like to live my truth so nobody can use my truth against me. So instead of running from the term shook, I'm embracing it. This is... Um... For, for a black man to come out and talk about this as openly as you do is a rare thing. You know, I'm, I'm a God-fearing man, you know, so I feel like sometimes, you know, God lets things happen to you so he can work through you. Yeah. And I think the easiest thing for me to do is just share my experiences. Like, I'm not an expert at anything. I don't have any doctor in front of my name, okay? I didn't even, I didn't even, go, I didn't even go to college. I don't have a degree. So I'm not an expert at anything. I just have some experiences. So one of the easiest ways for me to even deal with the things I'm dealing with is to talk about it. That's why I'm so glad I have radio. I'm so glad I have podcasts. And, you know, I feel like just sharing that experience is what's going to make 
other people speak up. And I didn't realize that, you know, it was such a need. How has fear helped get you where you are today, though? I know people who have paralyzing anxiety to where they can't even leave the house when they have panic attacks, you know. Right. When I have panic attacks, I get so scared that I got to go do something. Charlemagne the God's celebrity interviews have catapulted him to pop culture fame. He's also a New York Times best-selling author and recently released his second book, Shook One. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you, I've read this book, and he just was saying before we went to break, he said, I'm not an expert in anything, don't have any letters behind my name. But I'll tell you what, this book is written from the heart, and it is very insightful. And there's a lot of inspiration in this book, because the universe rewards action, and this is a guy that has taken action and is doing something about it. So, Thank you, Dr. Phil. I promise I mean, my I, check will clear. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that a great example. You mentioned that a great example of how fear of failure can get in the way of success is the interview that you did with Kanye. Tell me about that. Yeah, because um, I feel like we were just overthinking the situation. You know, you have two people, I guess, who want to always have control and always looking for the right time to do something. But, you know, there, there never is a right time to do something. You either do it or you don't. And so, like, we taped this interview back in early April of, of this year, and we held on to it forever. But I do believe in the universe, you know, working things out in our favor, because when he finally did put the interview out, it was May 1st. May 1st was the first day of mental health awareness month, Yeah, you know? And, I mean, he went to... TMZ and wild out on the same day, and, but I still feel like it, 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 it I, feel, I still feel like it worked out and it did what it was supposed to do. Yeah. There's a quote in your book. You say, there's no question the stress I experienced as an African American, especially a poor one, growing up in the South has directly led to my issues with anxiety. And talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, I think it's just a different level of anxiety that comes with being black in America. That's why I, I, I call it being black annoyed, because you're black and paranoid in America. Like, if, if I get pulled over, if, if, if I get pulled over by the police, you know, I'm thinking about a whole different <laughs> set of circumstances <laughs> other than whether I was speeding, yeah. whether I moved into a different lane. Like, I'm just, like, am I going to get shot today? Like, that's yeah. honestly yeah. my mindset. Now, yeah. I don't know if it's exaggerated because of the fact on social media, there's so much social engineering going on, and you see these videos over and over of, of, of unarmed black men getting killed at the hands of the police, but whatever it does, it doesn't do anything good for me and my anxiety. Yeah, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, but... Um, how has fear, how has fear helped get you where you are today, though? Well, I feel like I use the fear as fuel, because I don't have any other choice. Like, you know, I got a homegirl, her name is, uh, Kay Fox, and, you know, she sent me this acronym one time, and it was FEAR. And it was face everything and rise, or fear everything and run. Now, I'm totally aware that I have friends, and I know people who have paralyzing anxiety to where they can't even leave the house when they have panic attacks, you know. Right. When I have panic attacks, I get so scared that I gotta go do something. Yeah. You know, and, and, like, I, I think about how when my father used to tell me if I don't change my lifestyle, I'm gonna end up in jail, dead, or broke sitting under the tree. I literally would have panic attacks thinking about one of those three options happening to me. And when they really did start happening to me, like, you know, I actually did start going to jail, or people around me that I knew actually did start getting killed, or, you know, people I used to look up to were really broke sitting under the tree, that scared me into just going to do something. So I worked mad odd jobs. I worked at Taco Bell, got fired after only two weeks. Bye. <laughs> by my sister, who was the manager. Yeah. I got fired from A&W root beer stand, so don't feel, don't feel bad. I was fine until they put us on skates, and then I was screwed. Oh, gotcha. uh, Charlemagne says he showed up at his daughter's daycare and stood by the door like Tupac by the locker in the movie Juice. We'll find <laughs> out why next. <laughs> Tell me how your parental paranoia got worse after having children. Oh, man. I mean, because I had children. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's like, you know, as a, I think anybody in here who has kids, our kids are our hearts literally walking around outside of our bodies. Yeah. And we try to micromanage that situation as much as possible. And we try to control every little aspect of their life. Like, I got three girls. I got a 10-year-old, a 3-year-old, and a 1-month-old. Damn. Yeah. 
Y'all know I used to be a player, huh? I'm getting what I deserve. Okay. And it's like, you know, my daughter's 10 now, and she's in, in, in fifth grade. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I don't want her to experience a lot of the things that I feel like I had to experience growing yeah. up. And, like, you know, you, as, a, as, a, as a black man who lives in a, a pretty nice neighborhood and she being, like, the only black girl in the class, a lot of times things don't happen for her. And I have to wonder, is it a matter of circumstance or is it the color of her skin? And it, I know it's probably just in my mind. It could be simple stuff, like she tries out for the Willy Wonka play, and instead of getting the main role, they make her an Oompa Loompa. And I'm like... Yeah. You know, it's just because she's... You know, I don't want to say it. It's just because she's black, you know? So it's just like... It's just certain things you can't control. You kind of got to remember your serenity prayer in situations like that. And the serenity prayer is, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Like, you got to relinquish that control when, when your children go out into the world. But you feel like as soon as you let go, that's when something bad is going to happen. It's just, that's your kids. Like, I, I don't, if, if, if y'all have a way to not worry about your children, please let me know. I, I really want to reiterate the fact that you talk about this and people see that you can experience anxiety and experience panic attacks and still be okay. It doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you flawed. It doesn't make you something to be ashamed of. I don't know if I'm Gives... okay. I'm just okay not being okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. It, it means you, you can be flawed and you still keep going. You still yeah. get up every day. You still go to work every day. You're still a parent every day. It is, it's not a success only journey and that's okay. Yeah, and that's what I mean when I say I feel like I use my fear as fuel because like I said, I don't have any degrees. Like there's no backup plan for me. Trust me, I wake up every day and look at the ceiling of my house and being like, what did I do to get here? Why am I here? Like, I don't feel special. You yeah. know what I mean? I didn't, do, I, didn't, I didn't do anything special to get here. Like, my mom was a school teacher in South Carolina for 30 plus years. The most she ever made a year was $30,000. Yeah. I, I get that for an appearance sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just, you know, so like that makes me feel bad. Like that actually gives me like a, a sense of, of guilt. And sometimes I wake up and feel like, man, the light's about to get cut off at any moment. Yeah. Plus, I think I got PTSD from being fired four times. Yeah. 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 Unfairly, I'm sure. I mean, three of them. One yeah. I totally deserve. Yeah, one you totally deserve. Yeah. All right, look, the book, as I say, is Shook One. And you guys know I don't recommend books lightly. I recommend this book. Read it. I want to thank all of my guests today. A special thanks to Charlemagne the God. You can pick up a copy of Shook One at bookstores and online. And by the way, everybody in the audience is going home with a copy. We'll see you next time. I'm sorry. I want to know what I can do better. I really, really want your help. I'm just going to be honest with both of you. You guys have been very disrespectful of this whole process. You've been disrespectful to me on the stage. You've ignored all the work that my staff did, and you are not interested in what happens with that child. This tape's going to court. And when it goes to court, you're not going to like the results. I will tell you an alternative that I believe that the two of you should do and I'm even willing to pay for it. Let me bring in some professionals that will meet with both of you individually and then together and work out a parenting plan. What's important is that you follow some rules and put the child's interest ahead of your own. You take the help? I, I will absolutely take the help. Deal? Mm -hmm. Deal? Yep, I hope it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will if you uh, throw yourself into it. Thank you. Thank you for talking to me again. If you want to roll your eyes and not do it, then don't. No, I'm sorry. I'm not rolling my eyes at you, Dr. Phil. Yeah, you are. No, no I, I don't mean any disrespect. I'm not trying to yeah, roll my yeah, eyes. Yeah, you are. You're rolling your eyes like you already know how this is going to turn out. You're not doing me a favor. Just head back to court and take your best shot. I don't want to go to court. I'm just offering you an alternative. If you don't I, want it, don't take no, it. No, I totally want it. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean any disrespect yeah. to you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot.